Hey everybody, tonight we're debating Christianity, Islam, violence, and intolerance, and we're starting right now with David Wood's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, David. The floor is all yours. Hey, that was quick. <laughs> Start a timer here. Uh, well, hello again, YouTube. Looks like I'm back. Just got unbanned again this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Modern Day Debate for... Uh, setting up this exchange, and Daniel for representing the Muslim perspective. Daniel has a reputation as someone who doesn't lie about his religion, which will be a breath of fresh air compared to most of the American and British Muslim apologists I've interacted with uh, over the past 15 years or so. Um, trust me, all you westernized Muslim apologists who are watching, uh, when you tell us that there's no death penalty for apostasy in Islam or that Aisha was 19 years old when she married Muhammad, this may win you some cheap dawah points with people who don't know any better, but it becomes impossible for the rest of us to take you seriously. But if you're honest about your book and your prophet, then even if we disagree with you completely, we can at least have a serious discussion with you. So hats off to Daniel for having the integrity that's so often lacking in Western Dawah. The topic before us was suggested by Daniel. As far as I can tell, here in my opening statement, I'm supposed to present the Christian perspective on violence and tolerance. There's obviously a lot that can be said on this issue, but given the time constraints, I'm going to cover three essentials. One, the biblical teaching that human beings are created in the image of God, along with how this influenced Christian thought when it was combined with Jesus' command to love everyone. Two, the biblical teaching that even though we love everyone, some people are especially bad or dangerous, and that there is a role for violence in protecting people from harm. And three, the Christian integration of these two biblical teachings, that is, how do we protect society from dangerous people while still loving and honoring all people? First, the image of God, the Christian perspective on violence and tolerance begins with the teaching in the very first chapter of the Bible that human beings, all human beings, men and women, are created in the image of God. Genesis 127 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. In Genesis 9, the basis for the prohibition against murdering another human being is that humans are created in the image of God. In the New Testament, the book of James, James says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. James's objection to cursing other human beings is that they're created in the image of God whom we praise. So our view of other human beings as created in God's image is supposed to have an impact on how we act towards them. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. We can see how this command to love even our enemies, combined with the biblical teaching that all human beings are created in the image of God, influenced early Christian thought. In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. If your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. In 1 Corinthians 16, he says, let all that you do be done in love. In 1 Thessalonians 3, he says, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 12 says, pursue peace with all people. In 1 Peter 2, the apostle Peter tells us to honor all people. So whether you are Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, young, old, white, black, straight, gay, trans, whatever, you are created in the image of God. And Christians are commanded to love and respect you based on our shared nature and the love of God. This doesn't mean that we have to love and respect your ideas or your decisions or your actions doesn't mean that you shouldn't be punished for crimes. We can love someone and still believe that he's a danger to others and that he needs to be stopped. 
This brings us to our second point. According to the Bible, governments have the authority to punish wrongdoers and the obligation to protect people's rights. This includes the authority to use violence when necessary. In Romans 13, Paul calls rulers avengers who bring wrath upon the ones who practice evil. He says that the ruler does not bear the sword for nothing. But this authority doesn't mean that rulers get to do whatever they want. In the book of Acts, chapter 25, the Roman governor Festus wants to hand Paul over to his Jewish enemies who are plotting to kill him. Paul responds to the governor, if I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. So Paul was convinced that the government was supposed to protect him from people who wanted to kill him over his religious views. And he was convinced that no one, not even the government, had the right to kill him if he hadn't done anything that merited a death sentence. The Christian perspective on governments then punish wrongdoers and protect rights. Sometimes this involves violence. Third point, how do we reconcile the Christian belief that we're supposed to love everyone and to honor all people and to pursue peace with all people with the fact that some people need to be punished and that there are wars that may need to be fought? One thing Christians did early on was to influence governments to have more concern for human life. This was obviously connected to Christian love for others. I'll give two examples. First, when Christians began preaching the gospel in the Roman Empire, the favorite form of entertainment among the Romans was the gladiatorial games. The crowd would cheer with glee as slaves and prisoners were forced to hack each other to pieces. Christians were horrified at the bloodshed because they believed that human beings are created in the image of God. What did they do about it? Well, at first, when they had no political power and Christianity was still an illegal religion, they boycotted the games. Within a century of Christianity becoming a legal religion, Christians had the gladiatorial games abolished throughout the empire. Second, infanticide, killing unwanted babies and leaving them to die, um, or, or leaving them to die, was extremely common among the Greeks and Romans. Children born frail or with defects would be tossed in a river or left in the woods to die. Unwanted daughters would be tossed in a river or left in the woods to die. Christians condemned this practice in the first century. In the second and third centuries, when Christianity was still an illegal religion, Christians would collect abandoned babies and care for them. After Christianity was legalized, in 374, the Roman Emperor Valentinian outlawed infanticide and child abandonment. So moral reform spread as Christianity spread. Christianity had a similar impact on the concept of war. Christians developed what's now called just war theory. Just war theory deals with issues like what are the appropriate grounds for waging war? Uh, how, should enemy, how should enemy combatants be treated? Uh, Christians like Augustine in the fourth century and Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century applied Christian beliefs about love, justice, and the responsibilities of human governments to theories about war. The developments continued into modern times and can be arranged into three categories. The Latin phrases are jus ad bellum, jus in bellum, and jus post bellum, which we can translate as right to war, justice in war, and justice after war. The principles of jus ad bellum right to war are directed towards those with the power to declare war, i.e. heads of state. The main requirement here is having a just cause to declare war, such as self-defense or protecting the victims of tyrannical leaders. Other requirements include just intent, uh, war should only be fought for the right reasons, last resort, all peaceful solutions should be considered first, and proportionality, the good outcome sought must outweigh the necessary bloodshed. Once war has been declared, the principles of use in bellum, justice in war, come into focus, mainly dealing with the appropriate treatment of the enemy. The most essential features of use in bellum are the immunity of non-combatants. A soldier may only target someone who is actively attempting some form of harm. Proportionality, the tactics used must be proportional to the desired outcome and the fair treatment of captives. 
when war is coming to an end, the terms of peace should be, uh, when war is coming to an end, the terms of peace should balance correcting the wrongs that led to the war with respecting the human rights of the defeated group. In general, jus post bellum, justice after war, calls for distinguishing between responsible and non-responsible parties and taking steps to ensure that the injustices that led to the war are not repeated. These principles were largely influenced by Christianity, but most of them have become relatively universal by inclusion in the Hague Conventions, the Geneva Conventions, the Geneva Protocols, and various UN resolutions. I should probably clarify here that when I talk about a Christian perspective on war, I'm not claiming that Christians have always lived up to these ideas. Very often they didn't. But uh, this debate is about this debate isn't about how Christians or Muslims screw up or how they deviate from Christianity or Islam. I'm giving a Christian perspective on war and just war theory is a reasonable application of Christian values to the necessities of a dangerous world. Now, given Christian beliefs about humans being created in the image of God and loving others, even our enemies, and governments having the authority to punish wrongdoers and the obligation to protect human rights, how should we view Islam? Well, Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world, it calls for fighting unbelievers simply for being unbelievers. Christians and Jews can accept dhimmi status and live as second class citizens. If we don't accept dhimmi status, we are to be fought until we're dead. Polytheists and I'm assuming atheists have to convert to Islam or die. Needless to say, going around trying to subjugate the world because a false prophet told you to certainly wouldn't meet the requirements of a just war. And it shows utter contempt for human beings who are created in the image of God. So the Christian view would be that governments are supposed to protect people from jihadis. Muhammad commanded his followers to kill anyone who leaves Islam. Can you imagine? being taught all your life that the Quran has been perfectly preserved and that it's filled with scientific miracles and that Muhammad was the perfect man. And then you decide to do some research for yourself and you find out that everything you've been taught is a lie. You leave Islam, but now you're under a sentence of death because you didn't ignore reality. If we're going to have any genuine respect for human beings in this world, we have to allow them to reject false prophets. No one should ever be killed for rejecting an obviously false prophet. You're again, the Christian view would be that governments should protect apostates whenever possible. Muhammad ordered his followers to kill people for making fun of him, but Muhammad initially thought that he was demon possessed. He tried repeatedly to kill himself. He claimed to be a victim of black magic. He claimed that the devil tricked him into delivering false revelations. He had sex with a prepubescent girl. He married the divorced wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce by lusting after her. He tortured a man for money. Critics should never be killed for pointing out the obvious. Governments should protect critics whenever possible. Muhammad allowed his followers to beat women into submission. The beatings were so bad during the time of Muhammad that Aisha, the mother of the faithful, said that she hadn't seen any woman suffering as much as Muslim women. According to Aisha, Muslim women were treated worse than pagan women. And we can see the results of Muhammad's teachings in countries around the world. But Muslim women are created in the image of God. They deserve better than this. In short, since the Christian perspective is that governments are supposed to punish wrongdoers and protect human rights, and since Islam promotes wrongdoing and violates human rights, it must be opposed. Now, Muslim apologists generally don't want Islam to seem more violent than Christianity, and they don't want Muhammad to seem more violent than Jesus. So what do they do? Well, there are three basic routes they typically go here, all of them grounded in misrepresentation. Uh, one, they point out that there's violence in the Bible, usually associated with the Mosaic Covenant, 14 centuries before the New Covenant. There were commands to wage war against uh, groups, and uh, since God appeared to the Israelites in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, rained food on them and was performing miracles, um, there were harsh, very harsh penalties for disobedience. But the Christian perspective on violence generally has to do with commands that are directed towards Christians, not with the commands of uh, earlier covenants. And if Muslims have any serious problem with God command, God's commands in the Torah, they should take that up with Allah, who says that he revealed the Torah. Two, Muslim apologists often twist and distort the teachings of Jesus to make them sound violent. Muslim apologists are free to do this, but they probably shouldn't tell us that they love and respect Jesus if they're misrepresenting and degrading him. Three, Muslim apologists often point to the actions of Christians who disobey Jesus or obviously don't take his teachings very seriously 
as if these Christians represent Christianity. Um, and this is sheer deception. Um, now, I'm not saying that Daniel is going to misrepresent Christianity in any of these ways. These are just things I've seen from most other Muslim apologists. They misrepresent Christianity just as they misrepresent Islam. Daniel setting himself apart from other Muslim apologists. So maybe we'll get something different. You got it. Thank you very much, David, for that opening statement. And if it's your, if it's your first time here, folks, I want to let you know, first, welcome. We're glad you're here no matter what walk of life you are from. And also want to let you know we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics here at Modern Day Debate. And with that, thrilled to have you here as well. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah. Thank you to Modern Day Debates for hosting, and thanks to David, and thank you to everyone watching. The debate today is about violence and intolerance, Christianity versus Islam. Let me say right off the bat that yes, Islam has violence, and Islam is not tolerant of every belief and way of life, and that's a good thing, as I'll explain. But my problem with David Wood and other Christian apologists is that they are inconsistent and dishonest. I'm going to focus on three main examples of this inconsistency. The first is what we can call the Old Testament question. Imagine there was a hadith that described Muslim soldiers coming back from battle and reporting to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The soldiers report that they were victorious in battle and had killed all the enemy men. Then the Prophet asked sternly, what about the women and children? Were they also killed? The soldiers say, no, we didn't kill them. Then imagine that the Prophet wasallam, gets enraged at this and condemns the soldiers for not exterminating all the women and children. Now imagine that if a hadith like this existed, David Wood would have no hesitation in citing it over and over again on his channel, making a big deal about it, denouncing Islam for it, and generally characterizing Muhammad wasallam, as an evil, bloodthirsty man. But the reality is there is no such hadith. Instead, this is what we read in the Bible about Moses. In Numbers 31, verse 14 to 18 of the Bible, we read, and Moses was angry with the officers of the army. Moses said to them, have you let all the women live? Now, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Kill all the women and children, but keep the virgin girls for yourselves as sex slaves. That's what the Bible claims Moses said. So I want to ask David Wood, do you think that Moses was an evil, bloodthirsty man? Are you going to denounce Moses in this debate? Because I don't want to see how, because I don't see how you can denounce the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when you have the example of Moses getting angry because his soldiers are not killing enough women and children. There's nothing like that in the Quran or Hadith or in the Islamic tradition more broadly. The fact of the matter is when we look at the context content of Mosaic law in the Old Testament. It contains stoning. It contains expansionist war. It contains destroying the idols of pagan religions. It contains slavery. It contains all the things that Christians criticize Islam for, and it even goes beyond Islam in advocating killing women and children. So if Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran are evil because of these practices, then Mosaic law, Moses, and the Old Testament are at least as evil. Look, I recognize that Christians will say that Moses is not the ideal and that Jesus is the true model of Christian values, but that response misses the point. The point is that traditional Christianity does not view Moses as evil. In fact, Moses has always been highly regarded by both Christians and Islam. Yet Christians like David Wood don't view Moses as an evil warmonger, but they do say these things about Muhammad. Why this blatant double standard? But the problem gets even worse for Christians. This is because obviously Moses didn't just make up the law. He was only conveying the commandments of God Almighty. So if stoning, expansionist war, and slavery are evil, then the God of the Old Testament was evil. Is David Wood going to denounce the God of the Old Testament? Now, let me speak directly to all Christians in the audience. You believe that the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament, right? And that same God is Jesus Christ, according to Christianity, right? So when God in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 15 commands Saul to kill women, children, and even infants, that's really Jesus who commanded that. When God in the Old Testament in Numbers 31, 1 through 40, 24, commands the believers to take virgin girls as sex slaves, that's really Jesus who commands 
commanded that. When God in the Old Testament in Exodus 34, 11 through 17, commands the believers to destroy the Canaanite altars and destroy their idols and symbols, that's really Jesus who commanded that. When God in the Old Testament tells the believers to stone to death fornicating women, all those who violate the Sabbath, all those who blaspheme, all those who curse their parents, those are all in reality commands from Jesus Christ, right? Don't give me the usual Christian apologetics about the New Testament superseding the Old Testament and the New Covenant making the Mosaic Law obsolete. That is missing the point. The point is, according to Christianity, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, which means Jesus commanded all that killing and stoning and slaughter, all the massacres, all the bloody cleansing of the earth that's described in the Old Testament. Those are all coming from Jesus. And in fact, they're endorsed by Jesus for a 1300 year period from Moses's time until Jesus. Jesus' time. So you can't present this modernized picture of Jesus only preaching peace, love, and nonviolence. Jesus, according to Christianity, is quite a vengeful and wrathful God, or at least he was in Old Testament times. How can a Christian who has to believe all this about Jesus Christ turn around and criticize Islam for violence, especially since, according to the Bible, Jesus even calls for killing women, children, and infants? There's nothing like that in the Quran and Hadith. So isn't this the most outrageous double standard? David Wood, please explain this. Explain how you can criticize Islam and smear the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as a violent, bloodthirsty warmonger, when according to your own theology, your God, Jesus Christ, also commanded and approved of all these things and more. So David Wood, you're extremely dishonest when you criticize Islam, and in fact, Christians should really hate you for what you're doing because you're essentially training your fellow Christians to reject the Bible and hate Moses and Jesus. Because when you tell your Christian audience that Islam is a false religion because it has violence and intolerance, what's going to happen when those same Christians open up the Bible and read all the violence and intolerance within its pages? They'll have to conclude that Christianity is a false religion too. So when you try to score cheap points against Islam on violence, you're basically undermining the Bible and Moses and Jesus at the same time. You are, in fact, helping atheists drive Christians into apostasy and to lose faith. You're paving the road for this. How do you justify that, David? The second in inconsistency from Christian missionaries and apologists is what I call the Christian governance question. I have a question for all the Christians watching this. Do you believe that God sent down guidance for every facet of life? Did God give human beings moral principles by which to conduct themselves in every domain of our earthly existence? As Muslims, we fully believe that. We know that God sent down guidance through revelation since the beginning of human creation, culminating in the final revelation to Muhammad, وسلم, and the final revelation contains guidance for every domain of life, not just guidance for how to conduct ourselves as individuals, but also guidance in the domains of family relations, social relations, community organization, economics, and yes, even law and governance. And it makes sense, right? If God in his ultimate wisdom created us to dwell on this earth, he would also not want us to be stumbling around in the dark. He would want to provide us with the light of guidance on how to live life on the micro scale, but also guidance on how to organize our societies on the macro scale in terms of law, politics, and governance. In Islam, that guidance that encompasses both the micro and the macro is the sharia or Islamic law. But my question is, where is that guidance found in Christianity? Sure, Christianity sets down principles on personal piety, self-sacrifice, modesty, and other values on the individual scale. But what about the macro scale? What about law and governance? Where does Christianity, Jesus Christ, teach human beings how to regulate criminality, how to set up a just judiciary system, how to deal with hostile invading forces, how to stamp out social vice? Where in Christianity are there specific guidelines for these things? These things are important, right? Human well-being critically depends on a society with just laws and governance, right? So where does Christianity tell us what just law and governance actually entail? This is the Christian governance question, and this is really a question about ideals. What does Christianity say about the ideal Christian society? What does Christianity teach regarding setting up the ideal Christian nation? In Islam, there is no mystery here. Islam is very clear, robust, and detailed in its teachings about what kinds of law and governance the ideal Muslim nation has. In fact, Christians are very familiar with many aspects of the ideal Islamic nation because they're constantly criticizing it. They claim that the ideal Islamic nation has corporal punishment, capital punishment, uh, warfare, and so forth. As a Muslim, I 
gladly concede all of that. I have to concede all of that because the society of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the four rightly guided caliphs was the ideal Islamic nation and inclu included all of those things. But David and Christian missionaries just want to criticize the ideal Islamic nation without defining the ideal Christian nation. That's not fair. You want to criticize Islam and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, for Islamic law and warfare and governance, Fine, but what's your brilliant alternative? Look, it's easy for Christians to criticize Muhammad وسلم, for violence and intolerance because the reality of setting up laws and establishing governance is never a peaceful process. No matter how good and pure a person you are, there's always evil people that are going to oppose and fight you. So what are you going to do? Are you going to give up establishing just laws on earth and allow evil satanic forces to rule? Or are you going to fight back, which means resorting to violence? Because those are the only two options. What's so bizarre from Christians is that they criticize the Prophet Muhammad for this. They criticize him for violence, but that violence is inevitable for anyone who wants to establish a just society in the vision of God Almighty. The Bible attests to this. Just look at the life of, for example, Moses. When Christians compare Muhammad وسلم, and Jesus, peace be upon them, they say Muhammad was about war, corporal punishment, imposing law, while Jesus was about peace and turning the other cheek. Well, that's not really a fair comparison because Jesus was not involved in government or law. He was not a general. He did not call for armed struggle. So, of course, he's going to be relatively more peaceful. A fair comparison would be to ask if Jesus were to have created the ideal Christian nation and established God's law and justice on earth, how would he have done it? And how could he have done it without resorting to violence, bloodshed, and intolerance. The inconvenient truth for Christians is Jesus didn't create a Christian nation. Jesus can be understood as following in the line of many Hebrew prophets who did not aim to introduce a new law. Perhaps he was only refining elements of the old law. He didn't aim to provide any specific guidance on how to establish the laws of governance of the ideal Christian nation. So if you can't look to Jesus for guidance on how to establish this nation, who can you look to? Muslims have the example of Muhammad وسلم, as the model. Where What do Christians have. The third inconsistency is that what I call the politics of Jesus question. David Wood wants to make you believe that faith in Jesus's message should cause you to be critical of Islam, the prophet Muhammad, and the Sharia. But is this true? Would Jesus, as he is described in the Bible, disapprove of Muhammad? Well, it really depends on Jesus's political outlook. There are at least three possible options. The first possibility is that Jesus was not concerned with politics, law, and war. Rather, he's concerned only with individual salvation. In other words, Jesus is not a political messiah. Rather, he's an, in a personal messiah for individual salvation. On this view, Jesus is not concerned with criticizing or rebelling against the Roman pagan regime, and he would presumably not be interested in criticizing or rebelling against other regimes, like an Islamic government or a communist government or a liberal government. He is not concerned with politics at all. On this view of Jesus, Jesus' teaching do not imply, imply a critique of Caesar's law and military politics, but, but this would also mean that Jesus wouldn't be critical of Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, his laws and military policies. I mean, why would Jesus be fine with the pagan Roman emperor who was engaged in persecuting believers, but have a problem with Muhammad. So this option is out. The second possibility is that Jesus is concerned with politics and political change, but he's an anarchist who believes in abolishing law and armies because these things are violent and intolerant. This is why Jesus says things like, he who is without sin should cast the first stone, or do not resist an evil person and turn the other cheek if someone assaults you, or if an unjust person takes your coat, give him your cloak as well. The interpretation is that Jesus is not talking about an, eth an ethic of forgiveness in these Bible verses. He's actually talking about abolishing laws against assault and robbery. He's against policing people. He's against a military force that would stop a foreign army from assaulting and robbing the populace. On this view, Jesus would see Muhammad as very evil for the specific reason that Muhammad is not an anarchist. Rather, Muhammad is someone who passed laws and had a military policy which entailed violence. But of course, such a view of Jesus is absurd, and no pre-modern Christian ever believed he was an anarchist. So this option is out. The third possibility is that Jesus is concerned with politics, but he is not a proponent of anarchy. Rather, he wishes to establish a modern liberal state. According to this vision of Jesus, Jesus wanted a state that upheld something like modern human rights norms and had a foreign policy that consisted of strictly defensive wars. 
On this view, Jesus would condemn Islam because Islam is not compatible with such a modern liberal state. The problem with this option is that a modern liberal state of this type did not exist before the Enlightenment in the 18th and 19th centuries. Furthermore, modern liberal secularism was primarily created by atheists, deists, and critics of Christianity. Furthermore, earlier states established by Christians, like the Byzantine Empire, the Spanish Empire, etc., none of these were modern liberal states or anything close in terms of respecting human rights and so forth. How do, so how could Jesus have called for a state that never existed. This is a historical error, so this option is out. Furthermore, Christians should consider what is involved in a modern liberal state. It involves, among other things, protecting the free speech of people who blaspheme God, facilitating sex outside of marriage, which destroys traditional family and gender roles. Where is that? Where is it that Jesus claims that the state should protect so-called human rights of this type? There is no proof of this. By extension, there is no proof that Jesus would have condemned the Prophet Muhammad or Islam for not sufficiently protecting people's rights to blaspheme and have fornication and who attack family life. David Wood is abusing the historical Jesus by claiming that he was an advocate for these types of liberal ideals and that he would have disapproved of Islam. So this is the politics of Jesus question. And there's also the Old Testament question and the Christian governance question. If David cannot answer these three issues in the debate, he really has no leg to stand on in criticizing Islam for violence and intolerance. And thank you very much for those opening statements. Want to say, folks, thrilled to have you here. And if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button as we have many more juicy debates coming up in the future. You don't want to miss them. And with that, we are going to jump into one hour of timed sections, five minutes back and forth at a time, starting with David. Thanks so much. David, the floor is all yours. Well, I, I thought we'd hear a little bit more about uh, Islam there, seemed uh, mostly on uh, Christianity. Um, Daniel asks, uh, well, I'll, I'll take these a little out of order and spread them out over this, uh, uh, over these exchanges. Uh, but he says, don't you believe that Jesus revealed those things in the Old Testament? Um, you'd have to get your theology a bit more accurate. Jesus is the God man. God became incarnate just as he said he would in the Old Testament. So Jesus, the God man, wasn't, wasn't back there. Uh, his divine nature was um, as the second person of the triune God of the Old Testament. So you could just say, well, don't you Christians believe that God revealed those things in the past? Uh, yes, yes, we do. And so did your prophet. Uh, in fact, according to your prophet, Daniel, Allah revealed the Torah that you're uh, criticizing and calling, uh, saying that, that it calls for genocide. So uh, you and your followers are attacking your own God and your own prophet here. Interesting debate tactic. Uh, mocking your own God and prophet is, is sure to catch us off guard. Um, now, uh, there are um, a lot of differences between Mosaic law and Sharia. You're saying, how can we criticize uh, Islamic law if we had Mosaic law? And there are some obvious differences. Uh, Mosaic law was limited geographically. Islam is supposed to rule over the entire world. So if you didn't like Mosaic law, the border was right over there. Uh, you didn't have to, whereas Islam is uh, supposed to subjugate all of us. Um, according to the Bible, the Mosaic covenant was not the final revelation. It was a stepping stone on the way to a new covenant. But according to Islam, Muhammad's the final prophet. There's nothing coming after him. Uh, in the Old Testament, God gives the Mosaic law to the children of Israel after delivering them uh, from their bondage in Egypt. God doesn't go to the Jews during their captivity and tell them that if they faithfully obey his laws, then he will rescue them from the Egyptians. Instead, he rescues them first and then gives them the law. This foreshadows the gospel, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's Romans 5, 8. So biblical obedience to God is a result of God's love, not a prerequisite for God's love. By contrast, according to the Quran, uh, obedience to Allah's commands must precede Allah's love because Allah has no love for unbelievers or for those characterized by various sorts of sin. So uh, very big contrast between God redeeming the children of Israel and then giving them, you know, legal requirements and uh, Islam saying that you have to earn God's love. Uh, now claiming to, and this, this would be the, the most important one for our purposes here, Claiming to speak for God is a pretty serious issue, but the Mosaic law came with 
more than mere bold assertions by Moses. God provided miracles before, during, and after his revelation of the law. For instance, judgments on the Egyptians, parting of the Red Sea, water pouring from a rock, manna falling from heaven, and so on. And the, the pagans, the Canaanites, the Midianites, they were aware of these miracles too. So they knew who they were rebelling against if they went after Israel. By contrast, the Quran repeatedly denies that Muhammad's revelations were accompanied by any miracle other than the Quran itself. After being challenged by Jews and Christians for more than a century on Muhammad's lack of miracles, Muslims eventually composed a number of miraculous stories and incorporated them into later sources, um, but these stories directly contradict the Quran. Uh, Surah 10, verse 20, they say, why is not a sign sent down to him? from his Lord, say, the unseen is only for Allah to know. Then wait ye, I too will wait with you. Uh, 13.7, and the unbelievers say, why is not a sign sent down to him from his Lord? But thou art truly a warner, and to every people a guide. Uh, Surah 29, verses 50 to 51, yet they say, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? Say, the signs are indeed with Allah, and I am indeed a clear warner. And is it not enough for them that we have sent down to the, the book, which is rehearsed to them? So the, the, the big difference here, as far as I can tell, is God is clearly revealing who's in charge with Moses. And so if you rebel, it's clear who you're rebelling against. Whereas with Muhammad, my, my goodness, hey, look at my lo lovely Arabic prose. It must be from God. Uh, so the general rule here would be that uh, if a pillar of smoke uh, and a pillar of fire that led you into the promised land starts giving you orders, you'd better obey them. If, on the other hand, a pillar of perversion, a pillar of stupidity, who led you to drink camel urine starts giving you orders, uh, you say, no, you're a false prophet. You got it. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his five-minute response. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Well, let me just respond to the miracles point. Um, there are entire books written about the miracles of Prophet Muhammad, um, it's a whole genre, Dala il an Nabuwa. Uh, and, and there are so many hundreds of different miracles that were conducted other than the Quran. Yes, the Quran is the main miracle of the Prophet Do you want to call all of those fabrications that came later? What's your evidence for this? Because this, these are coming from hadith that even Western academics are sourcing to within 50 years, maximum, maximum 100 years of the Prophet Wasallam's life. Miracles that the Canaanites and the Amalek witness, where's your proof that those aren't fabrications? Uh, so I think this is a kind of a weak argument um, about God's love and that God loves, Jesus loves people um, just universally. Did he love the Canaanites? Did he love the Canaanite infants that were being uh, slaughtered by Moses' forces? Did he love the Amale Amalekites and all the other tribes that were uh, order to be killed and slaughtered and destroyed. And the other point that you made is that I'm trying to attack the Old Testament for its violence. That's not my point. Like you completely misunderstood my point, David. My point is that how are you criticizing Muhammad وسلم, and the Quran? How are you criticizing us for abiding by this religion when these things are found in the Old Testament and you don't consider Moses to be an evil person. You're the one who is inconsistent. I don't have a problem with the slavery that will have been practiced according to Mosaic law. I don't have a pro problem with many of these instances of violence and intolerance. The people who have a problem with it are atheists and liberals, the kinds of people that you are sometimes you know, fraternizing with on your YouTube channel. They are the ones who will criticize the Old Testament for those kinds of acts of violence and intolerance. I'm not saying that everything that's in the Old Testament uh, is exactly true, because as Muslims, we believe in, in tahrif, basically, that the older revelations have been modified and distorted and corrupted. And by the way, this is the view that is corroborated by Western scholarship. But I'm not going to affirm or deny these things that are attributed to Moses. I'm just saying you explain them. You explain how you cannot, you consider Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as an evil warmonger, bloodthirsty, but Moses, you don't seem to have the same 
position. As for this idea of the rules of war uh, in the Old Testament were only limited to a certain geographical area or a certain time period. Well, the time period is about 1300 years because that's the time that the Mosaic law was applicable. Whether it was limited to, to a geographic location, that's disputed. In fact, if we look at the Hebrew interpreters and the Orthodox Jewish interpreters, rabbinic authorities on the meaning of blotting out the Amalek, they viewed it as a continuous war from generation to generation. And there are many verses in the Old Testament that mention this, to blot out their name, to kill uh, their women, their children, their infants, even their oxen. So this is, you know, in, according to Jewish authorities, called harem warfare. And it's not something that was limited to just Israel. It could be expanded to other places. And there are examples of uh, discretionary war that we can look at numbers within the Old Testament. We can look at Deuteronomy, many verses that talk about the ability of Israelites and Jews to, according to Mosaic law, attack offensively and to destroy um, these other religions and these pagan practices because they are violating Mosaic law. So you haven't really explained this. And I cited all of those verses in my introduction. And I mean, this is a big issue because I don't understand how you can have this kind of conception of tolerance that you're applying to Islam, but this is also something that condemns the Bible itself. I'm not the one who is trying to condemn the Bible. I love Moses. Muslims love Moses. And we believe in the Torah. We believe in the revelation of the past prophets. They've just been corrupted and distorted, but I don't have a fundamental problem with the violence there. So I think you've misunderstood uh, my entire argument. You got it. We'll kick it over uh, to also, David. Wait, wait, I have 30 seconds. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. Sorry. Uh, so also you cited a lot of Augustine, you cited a lot of different Christian authors. I don't think that's really relevant because uh, I can also cite many Christian authors who said very intolerant things who and, and Christian emperors, Theodosius, who was very intolerant with his policies. You have to go back to the original sources because that's how you criticize Islam. You look at the prophet, peace be upon him. So when you're justifying just war theory and so forth, uh, place it in Jesus's actual Time. teachings. All right, we'll kick it over to David for five minutes as well. Yeah, well, the, the point about just war theory was simply that that's how uh, Christianity influenced um, governments. You were asking about, you know, how does Christianity uh, control governments and so on? Um, not by taking over governments, by influencing uh, human beings to have more respect for um, human life. Now, you, you said that there are entire books written on the miracles of Muhammad. I, I pointed out that th these contradict the Quran over and over and over again in the Quran. Muhammad is challenged by the the unbelievers. Hey, why doesn't your guy have miracles? Why is your guy so different from everyone else? If Muhammad is walking around performing these entire books of miracles, these objections make absolutely no sense over and over and over again. Uh, Muhammad is uh, challenged. Why aren't you performing miracles? And Allah keeps making excuses. Oh, it's because people from the past didn't believe in the miracles when they were given to them and so on. And so that's why Muhammad's not 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 uh, performing miracles. Um, so, again, this makes no sense if Muhammad is going around performing all kinds of uh, miracles. So my, all I'm saying here is, according to your book, according to your book, he wasn't performing miracles. The best explanation for later books saying it is that Come on, Christians and Jews were constantly challenging Muhammad uh, why he couldn't perform miracles. Eventually, Muslims wrote some stories. Very different from um, Old Testament and from New Testament. But notice the pattern that God gives, Old Testament and New Testament. If he's giving rules for living, he really backs them up with why you should believe where these revelations are coming from. And once again, that's the difference. That, that's the difference I see here. See, keep in mind, I have no problem with God uh, crushing people. I had no, in fact, when I was an atheist, one of the objections I had to the existence of God, you have, uh, atheists today who'll say, well, if God exists, why doesn't he, you know, make the world as pleasurable as possible or something like that? My objection was if God existed, he would wipe us out. I have no problem with God, um, as the creator, um, having authority over life and death. 
Um, so if God decided to destroy us, that's up, that's, that's up to God. Uh, if God were here, if God were right here right now, and he started giving us orders, and we said, we don't care what you say, we don't have to listen to you, and God said, well, now I'm going to destroy you, that, hey, he's, he's the creator, right? So according to the books that both your prophet and your God affirm as the inspired word of God, and which Jesus affirmed as the word of God, uh, the Exodus was accompanied by constant miraculous intervention. God is raining food from heaven. Uh, he is parting the Red Sea. And he's literally going around as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So here again, if there were a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud giving us orders right now, and you say, I don't have to listen to you. Or if you're, 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 you're not one of the people who were actually following him, you're someone else and you're saying, I don't care what that pillar of fire says. I don't care about these people who are just led through the, the sea. I say God has the right to give life or to take life. This is very different from Muhammad coming along. Someone who comes along and the guy thinks he's de his first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic. He has to be talked out of that by his wife and her cousin. Uh, he tried repeatedly to commit suicide. Whenever something was going wrong, he would try to kill, he would try to hurl himself off a mountain. Um, he admittedly was a victim of black magic that gave him delusional thoughts and false belief. He admitted that Satan tricked him into delivering revelations, promoting polytheism. I mean, where do you see that in the prophets? Someone delivers a revelation, promotes polytheism, comes back later and says, the devil made me do it. So this is, it's not just, hey, there's not enough good evidence here. Or there's not enough miracles. It's this guy is the least reliable person in history. If I were to line up every person who's ever existed and say, who is the least, who is the last person I would follow uh, telling me about God, uh, it would be Muhammad. Again, not just because he's not performing miracles, not just because he doesn't have any evidence. It's because he has this amazing collection of features that make him the least reliable person in history. Uh, and it's not just uh, the things I've mentioned already. It's, it's, it's other things like him just constantly getting revelations that have no purpose other than justifying, uh, than Allah giving him what he, whatever desires he has, happens to have for that day. And so massive difference, massive difference between God visibly appearing, giving orders and you saying not following you and someone saying I'm not following Muhammad because he's the most obvious false prophet in history. Thank you very much, David. We'll kick it back over to Daniel for five minutes. Oh, one, one yeah. second. I wanted to mention, folks, we have I don't know if we've ever gotten this many questions this fast. So I want to mention if you're listening, folks. We are thrilled to have your questions as it is. It makes it fun to have a Q&A, but I can't promise we'll get to new questions after this moment in time as we have had a huge amount come in. But go ahead, Daniel, for your five minutes. Right, so David is not really addressing the issue. Like we're not debating the miracles of the prophet Muhammad. So I said, we're not debating like the reliability of his message. That's not the point of this debate. It's about violence and intolerance. So you need to address the points that I'm making. You're, it seems like the argument that you're making is that Moses had miracles and therefore it's, it was okay to wipe out the Canaanites and the Amalekites and the other tribes. But that, how does that argument make sense? Because the order in the Old Testament is to kill babies as well and children. Uh, do the babies understand miracles? Do the children, like, are they responsible for recognizing the truth of Moses's message? Again, I'm not claiming that this is actually what Moses did. This is what, what is attributed to him in the Old Testament. So I want you as a Christian who accepts the Old Testament and thinks that Moses was given commands by God, who, by the way, is... Jesus Christ, part of the triune God, explain how you are not, how you would not be forced to denounce Moses's policies and Jesus's policies if you're using those kinds of criticisms against Muhammad. Again, about the miracles issue, you're just not really educated on it, it seems. Like there are many miracles of the Prophet Muhammad mentioned in the Sirah, in the Hadith literature, in the, just because the Quran does not, uh, it quotes disbelievers. Allah is quoting disbelievers of repeatedly refusing miracles, just like you, actually, just like you in this debate are refusing to acknowledge the miracles of the Prophet Muhammad. Dis disbelievers, Mushrikeen Kufar, in his time were also repeatedly denying that any miracles took place. But there were many miracles 
shown to all of the people within the Arabian Peninsula, including uh, things like splitting of the moon, Isra wal Miraj. Uh, this was the night journey to Jerusalem, uh, the miraculous night journey. There were even uh, stones and tree stumps that would speak in front of people and testify to the oneness of God and to the oneness of Allah. These are miracles that are found in our uh, Sirah and Hadith literature. You want to just deny it? Whatever. This is not what the debate is about. This debate is about violence. And you have not addressed any of the points that I made, like explain to me, is Moses evil or not? Uh, this should be not something that difficult for you to address. So far, the explanation that you have given uh, doesn't really make sense. And also with, um, you, you, you mentioned earlier, this idea that the commands of the Mosaic law were limited to a particular geographic region and a particular time. Again, that's not what Hebrew and Jewish scholars have said. Maimonides considered one of the uh, foremost Jewish scholars of history said that there is a continuous command because of these verses about the Amaleks to wage war, to wipe out paganism, including Christian paganism, throughout the entire globe. So this is an expansive global war against everyone, basically, who is not uh, following the Mosaic law. So Everyone has that interpretation. You have something that has no historical precedent, precedence, an interpretation that's not based on the actual words of the Old Testament and the authoritative religious interpretation of not only Jews, but even Christian scholars, because you have a lot, you have a lot of Christian scholars and emperors, Roman Christian Roman emperors, who interpreted the Old Testament in this kind of violent expansionist way, all the way up until you know the colonial era. And with, with colonial slavery, wiping out of the Native Americans, wiping out uh, many Native peoples throughout the world, all of that violence was justified on the basis of labeling the enemies of the Christians as Amalekites. <laughs> so how can you uh, deny all of this precedence, all of this interpretation, and instead you're talking about miracles and something that's really unrelated to this debate? We'll kick it over to David for five minutes. Um, yeah, on that last point, that it, that it was uh, expansionistic, that it was expansionistic and wasn't uh, limited geographically. Uh, Exodus 23, 31, God says to the Israelites, I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. So, I mean, he actually, he actually gives them a boundary. And you're saying there's no boundary. It's supposed to conquer the entire world. You're looking back at that uh, from an Islamic perspective. Uh, you say Jewish scholars don't view this, uh, the Old Testament, as, uh, as limited. But our, our topic is not the Jewish perspective. It's the Christian perspective. The Christian perspective, uh, we point out that in the Old Testament, God repeatedly said that there was a new covenant coming, that that is not the final covenant, that there is a new covenant and... Uh, if you're still waiting on a new covenant, that's up to you. But Jesus said uh, he was bringing the new covenant. Now, you said we're not debating uh, miracles or these other issues about Muhammad. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, the debate is not focused on those. But if you're, at, if you're saying I'm inconsistent, I'm inconsistent because I believe that God had the right to give, like, give life and take life in the Old Testament and that God could wipe us out if he wanted. And you're saying, well... If you think that God can give life and take life, why do you have a problem with Muhammad doing it? Uh, I think I've explained this multiple times that I, I really don't understand. I don't understand how this is not clear. If God is standing here right now blasting lightning bolts and he gives us orders and we say, we don't care what you say. God can issue whatever punishment he wants. When someone like Muhammad comes along, thinking he's demon-possessed, delivering revelations from the devil and then blaming the devil for them, um, trying repeatedly to kill himself, uh, saying that he's the victim of black magic that gives him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. When he goes around, he's sucking on the tongues of little boys and he, Aisha has to constantly wash the semen off of him. Uh, when he comes up with all these rules saying that uh, most of the punishment of the grave is from urinating improperly. So he has to tell you how to, how to pee properly and you, how to wipe yourself properly. And he just seems massively obsessive compulsive when I'm looking at someone like this, I'm thinking that this is the least reliable person in history. And the general rule, Daniel, is not everyone can just come along and say, hey, now the entire world has to submit to my rules. 
Now the entire world has to submit to my rules. Uh, you can't just be, you can't just follow any random person who, who, who makes these kinds of claims. If you're going to let someone tell you how to live, if you're going to let someone tell you about God, uh, you should probably find someone who's trustworthy. And Moses, who leads the children of Israel um, out of bondage, out of slavery, through the Red Sea, into the Promised Land, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, raining food down uh, on them, and then giving them continuing ongoing miraculous preservation in Israel. I look at that and say, okay, well, if he does that, then you should probably listen to him. I'm talking about Jesus, even according to Islam, he was raising the dead. He was cleansing lepers. It's confirmed by miracles. Uh, Muhammad comes along, all the Quran does is deny that he could perform miracles, and then you have to go to later sources when we know for a fact that was a period when Muslims are inventing stories left and right. We know this because, there, I mean, the reason for compiling collections like Bukhari and so on is there's so many false stories being invented. They were inventing stories about Muhammad like it was a sport. And again, even if you wanted to say you trust them, they contradict the Quran. And so uh, as far as uh, you know, us debating violence and intolerance, uh, yes, w we are. Um, I have no problem with, with, again, I have no problem with God uh, giving life, taking life. Uh, it's how do we know that something is actually coming from God? We have no reason to think that Muhammad is from God. And so Muhammad has no business going around taking life. Now, how much time do I have? I forgot to set a timer. You've got 46 seconds. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and you say that, that you're not saying that Moses did these things. You believe that uh, earlier revelations were corrupted. Uh, your prophet certainly did. Your prophet did. Your prophet believed that, that the Jews still had the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. In fact, in Sunan Abu Daud, he ordered uh, the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah, and they brought him the cop their copy of the Torah. And he said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Um, your God says in the Quran, uh, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you. So he clearly believed that uh, that the Torah is the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. And if you're saying he's wrong, well, that's one more reason to not trust Muhammad. You got it. We'll kick it back over to Daniel. Floor is all yours, Daniel. Yeah. So, David, do you have that copy of the Torah that the Prophet Sallallahu was mentioning? Do you have the copy so I can see exactly what is in it, so we can see if it matches the current Old Testament? Again, a, a completely irrelevant and stupid uh, point, frankly. Um, uh, so let me understand your position, David. Uh, so basically, you're saying that you would support sex slavery. You would support executing apostates. You would support slavery in general. You would uh, support stoning adulterers. You would support you know, wife beating, wife scourging. You would support all of these things if it was commanded by a prophet that had sufficient miracles. Am I understanding you correctly? So you're just hinging this entire debate on whether the Prophet them had uh, miracles that were sufficiently convincing or not. That's like your whole position. So really, you have no problem with uh, all of these aspects of Islamic law. You find them perfectly acceptable because if God had, if the Prophet them was a true prophet, and this is the message that he's bringing, then there's no objection that you have to sex slavery, slavery in general, uh, punishment for a uh, death penalty, for blasphemy, for apostasy, and on and on. You have no issues with those things in, in and of themselves. Just clarify that for the audience, because I think that'll be very revealing to your Christian audience. Um, what, regarding, you know, Muslims, have rules when it comes to purity and urine and how to clean themselves and wipe themselves. Yes, Muslims do have that. Islam does have that kind of level of guidance because Muslims are clean. Muslims are pure. We know how to purify and clean ourselves with water. And this is part of the guidance of revelation from the creator of all human beings. And that's the thing that Islam brings guidance from the minutia of human existence, the day-to-day -day existence of human beings, as well as the macro level things, such as how to run society, how to have proper uh, commercial transactions, how to have proper just judiciary systems, how to have all of these things that are so important for human existence. 
This was, as I mentioned, the Christian governance question. There's nothing uh, in Jesus's teaching that provides guidance on this. And I'm not trying to blame Jesus for this. I just don't think that that was his aim. I obviously, as a Muslim, love Jesus more than life itself. Jesus is the Messiah. Muslims believe that. We're awaiting his return, his triumphant return to establish the kingdom of God on earth, which, by the way, is going to be quite violent, even according to the eschatological uh, eschatology and the um, apocalyptic uh, passages within the New Testament. But, uh, you know, he, he wasn't, that wasn't his aim to establish uh, within t- that time, 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God and establish rules and establish regulations in the way that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, in the way that Moses with Mosaic law did before. So how can Christians uh, have an ideal Christian nation? What is the ideal Christian nation? This is what, David, you haven't even touched upon this topic. Please define that for us. And again, you can't just cite Augustine here and whatever um, cherry picking that you want to do to cite these kinds of figures and the the ones that most match this kind of liberal, secular, modernist view that you constantly advocate on your channel. Uh, show us within Jesus's teachings. Show us within the Bible uh, what are the principles of just governance and this ideal Christian nation, uh, because that's what I'm really curious about. And yeah, I think that it's it's. Um, don't bring into this uh, discussion about miracles and uh, these irrelevant issues. Stay on the topic, violence and intolerance, address those issues. Okay, go over David. Go ahead, David. All right, uh, Daniel, you ask about uh, the ideal Christian nation. There, there's no concept, and it, it's Muslims who regard this as a problem because they think of their prophet as coming to uh, take over the world, whereas Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus isn't here to establish the ideal Christian nation. Jesus is here to build the church. And so he does that. And as far as, uh, as, far as different types of govern- governments go, again, uh, the church would want to influence these governments. But Christianity, far, far more so than Islam, is, is principle-based more than rule-based. Um, in Islam, you have absolutely no clue how to do anything unless Allah tells you. You don't. You, you literally don't know how to pee. You literally do not know how to go to the bathroom. You don't know how to step into the bathroom properly. You have to have all these little rules for everything. And then you say, you see, well, you don't have those in Christianity. Well, Christianity is rule-based. It gives you principles. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's, it, we're, it, it's not built into our system that you have to have all these little uh, rules. We're created in, we're created in the image of God. We're not, we're not just, we're not drones here, right? We're, we're, we're ambassadors for the Almighty. Now, uh, going back, you, you said, do I have a copy of the Torah that Muhammad had? Well, that's a copy of the Torah that Muhammad had in 7th century Arabia. So this is almost, I mean, this is more than 2,000 years after the Torah has been circulating. Do we know what the Torah that Jews had in the 7th century uh, said, yes, we have copies of the Torah before that, the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on. We have copies of the Torah uh, afterwards. And so if that's the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, according to your God and your prophet, um, my goodness, if you're saying it's been corrupted, that doesn't go well for uh, for your God and your prophet. Um, now you asked, would I support things like stoning and death penalty for blasphemy and uh, so you said sex slavery? I just want to clear when you're talking about the Midianites and so on, if they were going to uh, take those girls, they had to marry them. They had to marry their captives. This isn't just you're going to be my, uh, you know, I'm taking you as my sex slave. So different from Islam. Uh, but as far as stoning and the death penalty for blasphemy, I don't know how many more times I can say it. And if you want me to be as clear as possible, yes, if there is a pillar of cloud right here, who is performing all kinds of miracles, raining food down upon us, and so on. And that pillar of cloud uh, orders us not to blaspheme, and we blaspheme. I, I have no problem with him, with him putting us to death. It's clear that we are in rebellion against our Creator. When someone like Muhammad comes along and gives us rules, not only is there no clear clear reason to think that in 
resisting him, we're rebelling against our creator. It seems like the exact opposite. Like this is an obvious false prophet and we're not supposed to listen to false prophets. So again, when a guy comes along and he thinks he's demon possessed and he, 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 uh, he's suicidal, tries repeatedly to hurl himself off a cliff. Um, when he, I mean, he admits that he delivered revelations from the devil. He admits that he is a victim of black magic. Um, his, his, his rules make him sound massively obsessive compulsive. I mean, you know, I mean, most people don't know, but I mean, you have rules for, uh, plucking here and, uh, and, and there. And I mean, it's just, he was obsessed with controlling every little facet of your life. You look at that and say, you see, it's this holistic thing. And this proves that it's from God. I'm looking at that saying, this is the weirdest dude I've ever encountered in my entire life. There's, I mean, again, it's the most massive collection of signs that this guy is not speaking on behalf of God. That's, yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you think that's the same as God speaking from a, a, a cloud of fire and giving you some rules, uh, we're interpreting this very, very differently. Um, and you again, seem to like this. You say we've got rules from use, for using the bathroom. Muslims know how to be clean. I mean, the rules are like uh, you have to wipe with an odd number of stones and you have to pee while squatting. And you don't need these things to be clean. It's just absolute nonsense to say that if you, if you don't pee uh, squatting, um, so much for the patriarchy here, but um, it's just it's just weird to say if you don't pee while squatting, you're 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 dirty or something like that. And keep in mind, your prophet said that most of the punishment of the grave is from peeing in property. You're not squatting to pee. And this just it, it sounds absolutely insane to me. So, uh, no, this guy should not be giving rules uh, about killing people. You got it. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his five minute response. I mean, yeah, it is disgusting if you are standing and urinating. Have you been to like some of these restrooms in public or even at in the houses of Christians, actually, where it's just urine everywhere and it splashes back on their clothes? Yeah, it's disgusting, man. I don't know what, what's why you're criticizing this of all the things you want to criticize. You're like, I'm fine with the stoning in and of itself and the killing for blasphemers, but it's the urine issue that I have a problem with. Uh, second of all, you're calling uh, Islam obsessive and the Sharia obsessive. But hello, have you heard of Mosaic Law? Have you have you heard of the Talmud? Have you heard of all of these kinds of rules and regulations that are found regarding the Sabbath and keeping kosher? Take a look at that maybe and, and see uh, if you're not overwhelmed with the amount of rules that are required in Orthodox Judaism, which is exactly it. Uh, derived from the Old Testament, according to Orthodox Jews. So if you have a problem with Islam in that sense, then you have a problem with the Old Testament again, and uh, Orthodox Jews, Jews in general. I don't see you making any videos about uh, them. Then the other thing is that people need a pillar of cloud, you know, a miraculous pillar of smoke and lightning in order to believe in revelation okay well then you're justifying all the disbelief in jesus in the world today uh by atheists and and by secular people isn't isn't that your argument you are undermining your in your entire religion with this kind of argument why should people believe in revelation why should people believe in the bible there's not a literal cloud of smoke that's commanding it this is the kind of stupid argument that People, the likes of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris make, and you're just parroting that. Like, where's the evidence of God? I don't see lightning coming from the sky. Where's the, you know, hand from heaven? And therefore, why should I believe in the Bible? This is the kind of argument you're making, and it's it's quite uh, ridiculous. Also, I want to really hold you to this point about um, expansionist war in the New Testament, because I think you should really read. Uh, this passage in, or maybe I'll read it for you in Deuteronomy, if I can pull it up. Yeah, in the meantime, you know? folks, I want to remind you, we have so many questions. I had never seen so many questions come in in the first 30 minutes that I want to warn you, folks, we almost certainly won't be able to read your question if it comes in this late. Sorry about that, folks, but we have to get these guys out of here so they can get to sleep at a decent time. But go ahead, Daniel. So I'll, I'll find in the next five minutes, I'll read you the exact passage, but it describes 
it rules for expansionist war, and it does not limit it to a certain border. It does not limit it to a certain time. I mean, look at the modern state of Israel. Okay, if you want to denounce Israel, that's fine, but they literally name their missiles, their nuclear missiles, Jericho, they name their nuclear missiles after these biblical tribes. And they and Benjamin Netanyahu, all of these Israeli politicians refer to their enemies, for example, in Iran or the Arab world, the Muslim world in general, and sometimes even American politicians as Amalek, as Amalek, the people that who, sh who that the Bible commands to blot their name so that you know, their, their names will be blotted from the earth. So this interpretation that you're given is, I don't think, true to the Old Testament. And I cite the Jews and, and cite um, Orthodox Jews because they have an authoritative interpretation of the Old Testament. If you want to denounce them and say that they don't know what they're talking about, only modern Christians, not even Christians within the first 1800 years of Christianity, but only us now in the 21st century understand the real meaning of the old testament okay you can make that claim it will sound ridiculous to everyone but feel free to make it kick it over to david uh, all right well I, I quoted um i mean i quoted exodus to you I, I will establish your borders from the red sea to the mediterranean sea and from the desert to the euphrates River. Um, there were times when the Jews would need to go to war with people from farther off, but this concept of uh, them having this obligation to go out and violently subjugate the world, that's that's an Islamic concept. Um, now, I don't even know why I'm, I'm saying this. Uh, uh, so you said, have you been to a Christian house? Um, Christians have urine all over. Um, <laughs> My goodness, yeah, that's definitely what our houses are like, isn't that right? Christians just urine all over the walls and so on. Do you see how they have to? <laughs> this is this is how Muslims think. We're just like walking around covered in urine. Uh, I have to say, it's I, I've heard it's much harder for a guy to squat while peeing. Keep in mind, we're not talking about sitting on a toilet. You're talking about squatting while peeing than standing up. Where I, I don't know, I have pretty good aim. I mean, I can write my name in the snow if I want to. Uh, you say the Talmud has lots of rules, too. This isn't about having lots of rules. I mean, according to uh, according to the Christian perspective, the Old Testament is a kind of schoolmaster until we actually get uh, the law written on our hearts. And so uh, it, it's not surprising that you would have rules. But it, it, I mean, that's that's not the issue here. It's that Muhammad comes with nothing except issue upon issue upon issue, and he's giving you all these details uh, about about how to regulate every little aspect of your life. It's almost like he's giving you all these things to keep you distracted from the fact that he is the most obvious false prophet in history, right? And he does with his obsession with proper ways of going to the bathroom and how many dates to eat for this and how many uh, stones to wipe yourself with and how frequently you need to uh, pluck this or that, Th that doesn't sound like a, a normal guy who's giving you important rules for living. I mean, it, you compare that stuff to, to something basic like uh, love your neighbor or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, there's there's no compare. I mean, there's no comparison here. And it really seems like here, do all these little things that make absolutely no sense. And these will keep you convinced that you're the true people of God and that you are, as Surah 3 verse 110 says, the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind and keep you thinking that um, that Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures, as Surah 98 verse 6 uh, declares. Um, now, you you misrepresented me here and said I was claiming that People need miracles in order to believe in revelation. Not my point at all. Um, I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're, if you're going to believe in revelation, yes, there there should be evidence for it. I believe we have that evidence, but that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm saying if someone comes along and starts saying, "Here are some, here you have to put some people to death. Uh, we have to execute some people. Uh, we can't allow blasphemy. Uh, here are the punishments for this or that." Um, you shouldn't just let anyone come up to you and start giving orders like that. Uh, and biblically, you're not supposed to just let anyone come up to you and start giving orders like that. That's why we're told not to not to follow false prophets uh, in the Bible. Um, and if you look at the criteria in the Bible for a false prophet, I mean, my goodness, Muhammad is like the paradigm example of someone that no one should ever 
uh, listen to. Uh, so when Muhammad comes along, and again, this is the same guy who tried repeatedly to hurl himself off a cliff. He's the same guy whose first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic. He's the same guy who claims to be a victim of black magic that's giving him uh, delusional thoughts and false beliefs. He's the same guy who keeps getting these revelations that have no purpose other than satisfying his desires to the point where his own wife, Aisha, his child bride, uh, said after he got one of these revelations, my, your Lord hastens to satisfy your wishes and desires. She's noticing this. When that guy comes out and says, um, we have to violently subjugate the entire world. And anyone who criticizes me, being the, the most obvious false prophet in history, anyone who criticizes me has to be killed. And anyone who tries to leave me has to be killed. And if, if our wives speak out, we'll just beat them into submission. Someone comes along like that. That is not the sort of person that anyone should be listening to. And so to actually compare that sort of thing, the most obvious false prophet in history, giving you rules about slaughtering unbelievers in the name of Allah and listening to him, and you compare that to a pillar of cloud telling you you better listen to him. Uh, again, there's no comparison here. Let's get over to Daniel for five minutes. All right. So I have the passage in Deuteronomy. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, they siege that city. When your Lord, your God, delivers it into your hand, put the sword to all, put the, sword to all the men in it. As for women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves, and you may use the plunder of the... Uh, plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at, at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. Okay, so this is Deuteronomy um, 20 verses uh, 10 through 20. So continuing, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes, completely destroy them. And then it mentions the, the tribes as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. So this is very explicit that it's talking about nations that are nearby and nations that are not nearby, meaning the entire world. And again, this is how authoritative scholars like Maimonides have interpreted, including Roman emperors, including the Byzantines, including the Spanish, on and on. Only modern liberal uh, Christians such as yourself, who really your true religion is liberal secularism and modern human rights, and you're just putting this Christian window dressing, only Christians like that have a different interpretation of this verse. You know, you want to reduce Islam to being concerned with, uh, you know, urine and stuff like that. Let me tell you what Islam teaches. Islam teaches belief in the one God creator without associating partners with him. Islam teaches to uh, respect, revere, and follow the prophets that have come throughout time since the beginning of creation of Adam, peace be upon him, all the way to the final messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Islam teaches love for your parents, respect for your parents. Islam teaches to look to the signs of God Almighty in the creation and marvel at his wonder and his bounty. Islam teaches you to have sincerity to God, to not be a hypocrite. Islam teaches you to not have hatred and hasad or, or jealousy in your heart. Islam teaches you to have wonderful families beautiful communities, worshiping God day after day, five times a day from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed to maintain the remembrance of God Almighty, Allah, on the tongues continuously with praising God, with uh, thanking God constantly and constantly called dhikr. This is what Islam teaches. It is the true religion of God. It is beautiful. And I mean, these are the sen this is the heart of the religion is true piety and love and devotion and submission to God Almighty. And then the bonus is that we also get to understand how to live life from the minutia, the micro scale, all the way to larger macro matters, how we can organize society, how we can establish a just society in God's vision on this earth. How can you live? I, I mean, Christians will be surprised. I'm surprised to hear you say that 
which you just did five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago, that actually there is no ideal Christian nation. Really? Are Christians supposed to just sit back and allow these tyrants and these satanic forces to just come and uh, destroy the churches to destroy belief in God? Are Christians supposed to just sit back and allow blasphemy, blasphemers, all under the banner of free speech and tolerance and liberalism to, you know, create this, uh, speaking of urine, piss Christ, right? Where they take an image of Jesus Christ and they put it in a vat of urine and they call this art. Or they go and start talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary and they call her a prostitute or a whore. And we're supposed to just sit back and say, oh, okay, there's no problem with this. Guess what? Islam has a clear solution for people who blaspheme against Jesus Christ, who blaspheme against the Virgin Mary. I'm very shocked to hear David would say that, yeah, we don't have any guidance when it comes to these kinds of issues because, you know, whatever. So Muslims, we have a solution. We're not going to let people do this piss Christ or insult the Virgin Mary. We don't tolerate that. We're not about that. And, you know, I really hope that Christians can see the wisdom of the Sharia and Islamic law, at least through this lens. Got it. Thank you very much. We'll go over to David for five minutes. All right. Uh, Daniel quotes uh, Deuteronomy, um, interpreting this as a command to subjugate the entire world. Again, you have to be you have to be viewing this through Islamic lenses. Where where have you seen Jews do this? Where have you seen Jews going out and subjugating the entire world? They did have a concept of being at war with other nations. They had a con not just the nations of their, the land that God gave them. They had a concept of being at war with other nations and of triumphing over them. They're not. They understand. <clears throat> they understand that they have to may have to have war against other cities that are far away. Uh, that they may conquer those cities and so on. Um, they're not going around subjugating the world. Again, where did they where did they do this? They had plenty of time. When did they do this? And they had they had some very powerful kings along the way. When did they do this? Um, you you said that my religion is modern liberalism. Um, no, modern liberalism has been influenced by my religion. But then they just they took God out of the equation. Um, and that's why they, they had some problems um, explaining their reasons, right? So, so the idea that we should care about everyone in the world, that we should love everyone in the world, that we should promote the the human rights of of everyone in the world, whether they, you know, whether other people are are the same uh, religion as us or the same skin color as us, and so on. Uh, that came from the Christian concept that God loves us, that we're created in the image of God and so on. Uh, eventually that permeates society and then they take God and Jesus out of it. And if you ask them, well, why, why should we, why should I be concerned with someone on the other side of the world? Uh, it's not a very good answer, but this is why we happen to line up uh, on certain issues like don't kill someone that you have no right to kill. Um, as we find uh, jihadis doing quite frequently. Um, you said Islam teaches, and you gave this thing, this list of, uh, laundry list of things that you believe is are good, one God, no partners, and so on. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, Islam seems a, a very Muhammad-focused religion. Um, Allah seems like a very Muhammad-focused God. Um, you know, we could get into, you know, kissing the black stone and so on. I, I'll admit that that is, that is outside um, our current topic. Uh, but you, you seem to be giving uh, this list that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. My point is that we have no reason to trust Muhammad uh, as giving commands uh, from God. We just have none. And so when a guy like this comes out and starts telling you, go and kill this person, go and kill that person, go murder this group, subjugate Jews, subjugate Christians, uh, tell these other people to convert or die, beat these women into submission, uh, kill that cartoonist over there. He's making fun of me. When someone like that starts giving you orders, the, the correct response should be, uh, why should I believe anything you're saying? And all we have is, well, Islam teaches one God. Islam teaches uh, uh, love for parents. Muhammad teach, uh, Islam teaches, uh, look to the signs, great families. I mean, I, I, I hear you bringing this up, great families. I mean, Muhammad had one of the most dysfunctional families um, I've ever heard about. And I grew up in a West Virginia trailer park, so we, we know about some dysfunctional families. 
Uh, but I mean, my goodness, all those wives, the, uh, the sex slaves, the wives constantly fighting and bickering. Uh, Muhammad gets caught with his having sex with his slave girl in his wife Hafsa's bed. Then, you know, he's where he's going to have to divorce all his wives because they're complaining. This is massively dysfunctional. And if that's your ideal pattern, uh, you got some issues here. And uh, so and the, the final point, you say that, uh, you know, Christians, we just, you know, we allow people to blaspheme. Uh, that's true. Jesus allowed people to blaspheme against him. Right. Jesus. Jesus did. People were saying all sorts of things about Jesus. Jesus said he could he could call on he could call on plenty of angels uh, to wipe them out. Uh, but he didn't. And so that's really the strange thing here that uh, I don't think you're getting. You think we're being inconsistent for pointing out that uh, that Muhammad did all these things. and There's there's no reason to think that he's speaking from God. And so we're hypocritical for pointing out all this violence. The commands that Jesus gave us to love everyone, even our enemies, we take these seriously. These are the commands that are directed towards us. So when Muhammad comes along and says that he's in the same line with Jesus and he turns Jesus into a Muslim prophet, that's blasphemy. So if you think that uh, Islam is here to punish blasphemers against Jesus, check the mirror, buddy. You got it. Thank you very much, David. We'll kick it over to Daniel for five minutes as well. And we've got only, this is the last five minute actually uh, portion. So floor is all yours, Daniel. Okay. Well, I mean, why did the Jews not conquer? It's not because, uh, or didn't conquer the world or have many conquests. It's not for lack of effort or it's not because they didn't have the command to do that. They just weren't successful. They weren't like Muslims. So, I mean, uh, don't hate the player, hate the game. That's basically what I have to say about that. And this idea that Christianity is inspired uh, liberalism, I mean, this is uh, very silly because, again, the main uh, writers of liberalism and the main creators of liberalism were deists. They were atheists. Some of them were extremely hostile to traditional Christianity, and they actually wanted to um, leave the influence of Christianity and the church and the influence of scripture. So I think your his history there is quite messed up. Um, about Jesus allowing blasphemy, uh, do you, so you think that Jesus would be okay with people being allowed in his society to uh, insult his mother and, and call her a prostitute and call him basically a you know, I don't want to use the word. Like, do you think a society, this is something that Jesus would approve of? Well, what's the result of such a society? Because this kind of widespread blasphemy actually leads to atheism. It leads to mass apostasy. It leads to the destruction of religion because religion is seen as something that is to, to be spit on, to be laughed at, to be insulted. And that's what we see in the modern secular West. And to say that Jesus is fine with that, it would tolerate that. Well, if you're really saying that, that means that Jesus's message is will lead to the extin extinction of Christianity. And in fact, when it, when you look at the actual um, uh, Christian fathers and the uh, Roman Catholic Church, they were extremely harsh about stamping out blasphemy. They were extremely harsh about stamping out any kind of heresy. Uh, so um, I guess according to you, they misunderstood Jesus's message because they were uh, forcing mass conversion. They were killing the heretics, the heretics. They were killing the blasphemers. I guess they, for a thousand years or actually 1700 years, didn't understand the true message of Christianity. It only took John Locke or Thomas Jefferson to come along and say that, you know, actually uh, Christianity is inspiring us to write the Declaration of Independence and to value free speech so that people can go and make piss Christ. I mean, this is a very bizarre interpretation. I mean, ultimately, um, when we talk about tolerance, um, what is tolerance? This is something that needs to be defined. So when David talks about tolerance, he's talking about a liberal tolerance. And this is based on the idea that we should allow people to maximize their individual freedom and any restriction on people's individual freedom using the law or using coercion is intolerant. OK, so, for example, if you don't let people blaspheme against Jesus, if you don't let people um, commit, you know, all kinds of deviant sexual acts and you restrict that, then you're being intolerant. 
So this is the kind of liberal tolerance that Islam doesn't have, obviously. We have all these corporal punishments, the hudud, and so forth, and we have expansionist war, and so forth. So we Islam is not tolerant according to liberalism, and this is basically David's whole argument. But there's another view of tolerance. We can call it traditional tolerance because traditional tolerance is based on the idea that individuals and human beings, they need to uh, be in families. They have a need to be in loving marital relationships. They have a need to be a part of a community. They need to have faith in God and have a connection with God. And these are all values that are extremely important to human beings. But if you uh, have this kind of tolerance, this liberal tolerance for everything where you're maximizing human liberty, human freedom and choice, that will actually destroy marriages, that will destroy families, that will destroy communities. And this is exactly why liber uh, Islam restricts people's individual liberty, despite people saying that this is intolerant or this is contrary to liberalism. Yeah, Islam does contradict liberalism and this idea of liberal tolerance, but we want to tolerate, and this is very clear within the Sharia, we tolerate Christian uh, family law, Jewish family law, the Sharia, yes, it's not, uh, doesn't grant equal equality between Muslims and religious minorities, but it allows this kind of tolerance. And when we look at uh, the history of Christianity in the Muslim world, Christians have been living for over a thousand years with their institutions, with their religion and rituals in Muslim lands run by Sharia, but look at 200 years of secularism, Christianity is dying out. Christianity is on the way out, churches are closing, there's mass apostasy, and, and this is the value time. of secularism. We will jump into, I don't know how this is going to go, but we are going to go into open dialogue. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And by the way, I want to remind you, folks, our guests are linked in the description. We really do appreciate these guys. And so I want to encourage you, as always, to attack the arguments instead of the person in the live chat and the comments. But with that, we're going into open discussion. The floor is all yours, gentlemen. All right. Um, you, you, you seem really confused, and I, I get it that most Muslims are, um, about how we could uh, not, I guess, kill someone who blasphemes against Jesus. And, and this goes back to... Uh, to different ideas in our religions. If there was ever a time, if there was ever a time to defend Jesus by slaughtering his enemies, that would have been in the Garden of Gethsemane, where a group of soldiers came to take him uh, into custody and ultimately take him to his execution. And one of his followers, Peter, actually did, uh, actually did pull out a sword and uh, used it. Jesus rebuked him said, put your sword back into its place. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So the idea that we have from Jesus is, uh, hey, God doesn't need you out going around uh, slaughtering people who say something about Jesus. But notice, if we didn't hold that view, if we said, nope, anyone who says something wrong about Jesus, anyone who, who, uh, who condemns Jesus, uh, anyone who blasphemes Jesus, uh, we have to go on uh, a killing spree. I mean, Islam blasphemes Jesus every bit as much uh, as uh, any atheist does, and so look at look at what you're saying. You, you you're you're arguing for a massive bloodbath. Hey, anyone who says something wrong about Jesus, we have to go on a killing spree. So we got to go oh, and I kill. Mean, is, we got to go is... kill the atheists. We got to kill the Muslims. We got to kill no, everybody. No, 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 no. This is this is not the point. First of all. Uh, uh, Islam and Christianity are the only pro-Jesus religions in the world, right? And there are plenty of religions, actually, that are, are atheists and Jews. They have a very derogatory notion of Jesus. Arguably, they are anti-Jesus. You don't have any criticism for them. You want to say that Muslims are blaspheming Jesus when we love Jesus. We're expecting his return. We want to be followers of Jesus in the end times. Okay, so if this makes us, you know, be blasphemers that you want to focus on, that seems kind of bizarre. But I want to ask you this question. When you say that live by the sword, die by the sword, this is Jesus's value. Okay, that can be a good personal value of self-sacrifice, forgiveness. I concede that. But what if you are in a Christian city or a Christian country, a nation, and there is an invading force of pagans, let's say, or whatever, atheists who want to come and slaughter all of the Christians. They want to take all of your land. They want to take all of your property. Should the Christians as a policy 
just turn the other cheek and say, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. We're not going to resist. Is this the kind of pacifism that you're advocating? Uh, no, and I, I thought I made this clear in my opening statement. I don't know if you were, uh, if you caught it all, um, but the the New Testament does talk about governments and protecting people's rights and having to punish uh, wrongdoers and so on. And and it's it's the combination of this this idea of respecting other human beings and loving other human beings while understanding the necessity for war in certain circumstances that gives rise to just war theory. So I know, you, you know, you're a little confused by me quoting Augustine and so on. There, I was just giving a little history about how, how the, the, the ideas were brought together um, and applied to, uh, to other situations. But uh, as, far, as far as what Jesus was saying, Jesus is talking about pe- sort of people coming after him right there. It's understood that there are governments, that there, that there are laws. Huh? But that, that's what I'm saying. It's a contradiction. People were coming mean? after Jesus, and he says, don't raise a sword. So that kind of value, that kind mm-hmm. of teaching cannot apply for an entire nation of people. Because that's it, the, 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 Bible, the Bible doesn't, it, it, I don't believe that that does apply. Uh, that The idea there is you've got Jesus. If someone's coming after Jesus and God knows what he's doing and Jesus tells you, hey, do not defend me. Uh, it seems it doesn't seem like now I should be going around killing people over Jesus when when someone actually did that when someone actually tried to do that tried to de- tried to defend Jesus with a sword he said don't do that he's not he's not saying he's not saying hey no one should ever defend themselves or countries shouldn't defend themselves against invaders and so on you are specifically asking uh, you know how can we allow blasphemy against Jesus how can we not um, kill people so, over so blasphemy no, against Jesus. You, I'm saying, I'm saying that's the example we got from Jesus. If Jesus is saying, "Hey, don't hack people up over me," then who am I to say now? You know what? I think I got to go start hacking. That. I got to, I got to start hacking people up over Jesus. So then, how do you interpret all of these Christians uh, throughout history? All of the uh, Roman emperors, Christian Roman emperors in the Catholic Church that were killing heretics. Oh, in, 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 in Jesus's name because of oh, their I, beliefs. I can tell you. I can tell you. Yeah, I can give you. I give you. So you're going to denounce all of that. This is this is my take on this. Right. For three centuries, for three centuries, Christians didn't kill anyone. It never occurred to them that they're supposed to control the world. Um, the it, according to the New Testament, the harshest penalty that the church gives as the church is excommunication. Paul says, who am I to judge those outside the church? God will judge those outside the church. So the Christian concept, as far as you know, penalties and so on, is, hey, you don't want to follow the rules of Christianity. There's the door over there. There's the door. Christians don't cause any problems and will generally be fine uh, under, under various governments. When Christianity permeated the Roman Empire, the Emperor Constantine eventually gets a dream. So, he start- so he's a pagan, but he gets a dream and he sees a cross and uh, he, he in in this uh, dream, which he interprets as revelation, uh, it says conquer by this. So he's supposed to conquer by the cross. What you have there, again, this is my take. What you have after that is a sort of Christian Roman emperor Roman Empire hybrid. And the Roman Empire had a Roman Empire kind of way of doing things. The the ideals of the Roman Empire are crush everything that gets in our way, uh, destroy. We have to control. Uh, we have to control the world. We have to conquer. And then now it becomes. And we're doing this with Jesus. We're doing this with Jesus. We're doing this with Christianity. So it's, it's my view that these 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 ideas don't come from Christianity. You never get the idea from the Apostle Paul or from well, it the actually teachings do, of Jesus. Because Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So he actually does explicitly endorse Caesar. He does endorse actually the Roman Empire. Yeah, but that's not that's not him controlling it. I mean, that, that's a pagan Roman emperor. That's that's Tiberius there. Exactly. So it's Jesus. Is yes, Jesus is saying. But you're not even, you're not going that far. You're saying that you're actually distancing Christianity from the actions of Constantine and these other uh, figures, authoritative figures, Theodosius and the ones who are killing all of the heretics that are killing. No, this the, this is the opposite. Of, this is the opposite of, of what you just said. So Jesus Jesus sees no conflict between. Um, having obligations to a non non Christian government and having your obligation towards God. So you you have your obligations towards God. You have your obligations towards your government, which isn't even a Christian government. Uh, what I'm saying is, what then those 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 two things combine. Well, I mean, if if you're talking about obligations to a to a government, that would be. I mean, in that case, it's it's paying taxes. You had an obligation to pay taxes. So he says, render. So you have Caesar. to support the invasion. You have to support the killing. You have to support with your taxes, as you mentioned, 
all of this expansionist war, all of the torture, all of the slavery, all the sex slavery. This is what Caesar is doing. And Jesus is saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So that's an endorsement. Uh, how is your interpretation that you're, you you mentioned several times? This is my interpretation. This is my interpretation. Okay, I don't really care no, they, for they, your they, interpretation. I want to know what Christianity actually says. And I consider these figures within Christian history much more authoritative than you. I mean, Augustine no. also justified persecuting heretics, mm. right? You're quoting uh, Augustine, but he's also yeah, and, justifying that in his books. And, and, and what I'm saying is if you look at what, Jesus said, you don't get the idea that you're supposed to go around uh, killing heretics. Again, again, he said, when you, when, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. That is an endorsement of that government, which was killing uh, her heretics, killing. That's the tradition that you're citing, right? With that, Constantine. That government, what, what heretics was the Roman government? Jesus uh, Christ, killing. he was crucified, right? According to you. Um, no, you're, 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 a little, you're a little confused. You're a little confused as to, as to what I'm who, saying here. Jesus is the, did you forget that Jesus was being persecuted? Jesus is talking about paying taxes to the government, right? So Jesus said, hey, you've got a government and you have... That's your interpretation, right? That's not what... When he says mean, render to Caesar, the, the, the... It means just taxes. That's what he said right there. That, that, that's exactly what it was. Caesar, should, what we pay the, should we pay the tax? Do, do you not know the actual story? They, they, they're, they're I trying. Know what, they're, I know how Christians have interpreted trying, that statement. No, it's exact. It's exactly the situation that they were actually in. Someone comes to the, the, the his his enemies come to him and say, "Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not?" Right. So they're trying to trap him here because if he says, "Yes, we pay taxes to Caesar," the sort of uh, the Jews who wanted to rebel against the empire are now going to hate Jesus. If he says, "No, we don't pay taxes to Caesar," then the Romans would crush him. Either way, he's in trouble. And he says, show me a coin that you used to pay the tax. And they show him a coin with a picture of Tiberius Caesar on it. He says, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. So that's, in other words, hey, that's right. his, that's him, that's his inscription. Uh, if he wants the coin, give him the coin. He doesn't seem to, the point is, this is not something we, we, we're going to uh, fight over. Uh, it's his coin. It's his coin. Give it to him. Right. So right, you know, we, can the, just, we can take your interpretation. No, it's not. That. That's exactly what the story. That's exactly what that's the story, the story says. But I'm saying what that's the Christians not, taken from when I that say, story. When I talk about my interpretation, I was talking about how later on, how later on you're talking about centuries later. Again, th three, three centuries of Christianity. If you're a heretic, the message is there's the door, dude. Uh, we'll try and convince you otherwise, but if you're not going to listen to to the leaders in the church, Christians weren't empowered to actually. Christians weren't empowered to impose those kinds of laws in those centuries. It only uh, was with Constantine. It was only with this um, conversion of the Roman Empire to Catholicism that they you, had the power. And as soon as they got power, as you just cited yourself with Constantine, they started killing in the name of the cross. Um, you, you should know very well. You don't. If you really want to kill someone, you really want to you kill a heretic. You don't need to have political power. We see jihadis. We see yes, jihadis going around. No, you don't. Jihadis go around killing people all the time. Um, you can be a vigilante. You can do all kinds of things. The point is, you don't get the idea kill heretics from Jesus. The 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 only example you have. The only example you have is people coming to kill him, and he says, "Don't defend me." Well, if Jesus says, "Don't defend me." And that's the situation, right? I mean, that's the situation. That's the perfect situation to defend him. His followers were ready to do it. And he says, don't do it. Um, again, who am I? There, this, there's nothing that comes after this, right? There's, there's, there isn't a revelation that comes after this and says, oh, by the way, now it's time to start killing people. So all I have is the example of Jesus who says, don't defend him in that way. And uh, so... Yeah, but, I, that, I mean, but if I don't you know take you... Jesus' example, look, there's multiple contradictions that I'm pointing out. If you take Jesus' example of not lifting the sword, don't defend yourself against violence, turn the other cheek. These aren't rules that you can extrapolate and make rules for an entire Christian nation. Um, otherwise, Christianity would have been wiped out within you know the first few centuries. Um, that's the main point that I'm trying to make, but you just keep referring to, okay, well, Jesus didn't say this, Jesus didn't say that. Um, but those aren't rules that can be applied on a macro scale. And this seems a, to be a problem for your interpretation of Christianity. Other Christians throughout history did not share your interpretation. They did engage in uh, 
execution of blasphemers. They did execute the apostates. They look at the Justinian, look at the Byzantine Empire, look at the Spanish Reconquista. They all had this interpretation uh, that is much in line with actually what we find in Islam. You're the only one, and, and Christians who follow this kind of liberalized Christianity, you're the only one who uh, does not see that. Uh, no, I'm looking at the Bible. Again, there's no indication. There's no indication. When the harshest penalty of the church is, there's the door, you're excommunicated. Um, and we see when violence starts, it's when you get this, this Roman Christian hybrid. Um, again, I don't see anything in Christianity that says go kill and slaughter unbelievers, go kill heretics, kill apostates, anything like that. Um, the only time you see that sort of thing arising is when it's combined with the Roman Empire. And it, the, the Roman Empire didn't start as some Christian thing that arose out of Christianity. The Roman Empire was already there, and it had its own its own uh, strategies for dealing with people. And it was you 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 crush everything that gets in your way, and then you sort of end up with some Christians who want to crush everything that gets in their way. Not what Jesus said. Not what Jesus said. So, I mean, you know, we can look back and, and try to understand them being in that situation. But uh, I mean, they didn't have that interpretation that you have. They're looking at the Old Testament. They're looking at Moses. They're looking at what Moses they're not, did. They're the not looking at any. They're not, they weren't yes, looking that's at any. What, that's what Theodosius cites. That's what he cites when he justifies killing uh, the pagans and destroying their religious temples, destroying their idols. This, these are the things that they cite. They what's cite the, the Old Testament. So, so you're saying Theodosius couldn't find anything from Jesus, and so he goes to the old. No, they looked at the which entire is Bible. Under. They looked at the entire Bible, and they said, "Look, we have Moses doing this. Jesus said that he he is a follower of Moses and that he respects him. Did Jesus denounce Moses? Did Did Jesus say that Moses was an evil man? What's no, the, what's, he endorses Moses. What's the What's the quote from Theodosius? I'd be, I'd be interested in, in seeing the reasoning. But uh, notice, it would be very, very strange of me to say, uh, hey, here's what I'm commanded. Jesus commanded me to love everyone, even my enemies. Uh, I'm told to live in peace with all men. Uh, I'm told to seek the good of all people. I'm told to pray for all people. I'm told to honor all people. But, you know, Moses fought the Canaanites, so therefore I'm going to go slaughter unbelievers in the name of Jesus. You really not understand how how strange that is. I have commands Wait, that are directed say, towards me. Hmm? The, the commands that are directed to Moses, or I, no, I no, no. I thought. said there are commands that are directed towards Christians, right? Jesus saying, um, Jesus saying that, uh, that that we have to love everyone, including our enemies. That that's directed towards how, can, how the is that a po of policy that a Christian state can take? You're talking about the Christian I love state. I love the enemies that are approaching my city and are about to Jesus genocide. Doesn't, Jesus doesn't tell a state. You can't talk to a state. Jesus isn't talking to a state. He's talking well, to a, a he's Christian talking to civilization can't exist. A Christian nation cannot exist. America. Have, many people have, consider America a Christian nation. And if an invading force comes, the Christians are all supposed to lie down and lay down their weapons because Jesus said, you know, don't you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I live in Texas. I think the Texans over here are not going to be very happy about this kind of interpretation that you are imposing on Jesus and saying that this is his message for a Christian nation. Actually, there is no Christian nation. There is no guidance on that level. That doesn't really make sense. You can have to a me. Nation. I don't think it makes sense to many Christians. Let me cite you Theodosian. In the Theodosian decree, it is decreed that in all places and all cities, the pagan temple should be closed at once. And after a general warning, the opportunity of sinning uh, be taken from the wicked. We decree also that we shall cease from making sacrifices and anyone who has committed such a crime, let him be stricken with the avenging sword. And we decree that the property of the one executed shall be claimed by the city and that rulers of the provinces be punished in the name in the same way if they neglect to punish such crimes, Codex Theodosianus and, and the citation. No, my, my, my question was, where, where does he say he's getting this from Moses? Where is he getting it from? I mean, he's basing it on the Bible in general. Yeah, where's, no, where's he? Well, what, what I'm saying is what he just said, that sounds exactly like what a Roman emperor would say. It, it just got combined with Christianity. In other words, that that's a... 
I mean, the thing that this policy from Mm -hmm. Theodosius and other emperors actually makes more rational sense because it seems like they're trying to expand and grow the Christian nation. They're trying to preserve Christians from, you know, uh, falling into worshiping false (laughs) idols. That seems like a reasonable policy, actually. What you're saying seems like the destruction of Christianity and making sure that Christians can't even exist past the first century. Uh, Think about what you're saying, because I, I, I think things make sense in your head, but they're totally contradicted by reality. Christians were persecuted for centuries without shedding a drop of blood, and they ended up taking over the Roman Empire, right? According they to you— over? Hey, how, did, how did they take over, though? How did they take over? By, by, not by killing. Not, not by killing. They didn't take over the Roman Empire by killing. People just kept converting to Christianity. So that's that's what I'm pointing out. The problem. So these converts that apparently know so much about peace and not killing, they immediately start killing. They immediately, Constantine immediately starts killing after he converts. Keep in mind what keep in mind. Constantine got this dream conquer by this. Now, now, now the now Christianity is something you conquer for. So that was a false dream. He had he has to. I don't know. I mean, it could be a true dream and he just misinterpreted it. I mean, yeah, I could I could say, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to conquer by the cross. It's not that I'm going out and hacking people up over it. Uh, but but I mean, it, it's very simple. If you're going around killing heretics, uh, killing apostates and so on, it's very simple. You've got the commands that are directed towards Christians as the covenant that we're under. And it's simple. Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor. And and you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be, be sons of your father who is in heaven. Is that consistent with going around uh, slaughtering people over Jesus because they, uh, they're they following the wrong thing? When, when Jesus was before Pilate and he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to my Jewish enemies. As it is, my kingdom is not of this world. So if he's saying his kingdom is not of this world, and you say we have to go out and, and uh, establish this kingdom for Jesus, you got issues. And, and when, when Paul says, let all that you do be done in love, when he says that Christians are to walk in love, when he says, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, when he says, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, when the author of Hebrews says that uh, we have to pursue peace with all men. When Peter says that we have to honor all people, it's just not consistent with going on a killing spree. Again, you, you keep trying to apply that to some Christian state. These are you, you could have a state that punishes wrongdoers and so on. Um, this is this is talking about individual Christians and how we're supposed to live and how the church is supposed to uh, function in society. How can the, the church, church function if it's not like an organized body that is has the ability to coerce, you know, because excommunication is actually you say it like, oh, just there's the door walk out of it. That essentially means that you are banned from society, which is is uh, condemning people to either death or a life of complete destitution and ruin. So that is actually coercion. Excommunication isn't some you know benign thing that you keep referring to in, in the first century. Christians are a persecuted minority. You say, get out of the church. That is, most of the world is open to you. No, I'm talking about the majority of Christian history. You are cherry picking these kinds of examples. You reference ex- excommunication. So I'm telling you the reality I'm, I'm, of what that is, has been historically. Like, look, look, Augustine is citing just uh, citing the Old Testament when he justifies persecuting heretics. So let me so notice he'd have to, you, you would have to go to the Old Testament, right? He can't just, yeah, the can't Bible, just Jesus. the Bible. He can't just Christians Jesus, believe right? in the Bible. Christians actually take their guidance from the entirety of the Bible. No one has this interpretation that you have, that everything in the Old Testament is irrelevant. Don't even look at it. No Never one has this that. interpretation. Never said that. Even, the, even Christians who say that the New Covenant uh, abrogates the Old uh, Covenant and the Mosaic Law, they still took inspiration from the Bible. They still cite the Bible. This is the first time I'm hearing a Christian. You can. Every time I cite something from the Old Testament, this is Augustine. You're trying to overtalk Augustine in your interpretation if, of, if, uh, of if Augustine, and, and the usage of the Old Testament. If Augustine throws out the words of Jesus for uh, an, another covenant, he, he's got issues. Just let me give you an example because we're. I don't. I, I don't think this is terribly difficult. But the, the Bible 
contains a series of covenants. So there's this, there's a covenant between God and Adam. God says, uh, you know, Adam, you do this and, and here's what I'm going to do. Uh, there's later, there's a covenant with Noah. As a matter of fact, I'll even give you a specific example. God gives a covenant with Noah, establishes a covenant with Noah. And as part of that covenant, there are uh, no eating restrictions. He says, you know, eat, eat anything that, that, that moves, anything you want to, anything you want to kill and eat. Later on, there's a covenant uh, with the children of Israel, and you can read, you can read the uh, the Torah over and over again. These are the rules for the children of Israel. These are the rules for the children of Israel, and under that covenant, you have all these dietary restrictions. You didn't have those under the covenant with Noah. It's a different covenant. You're talking about different covenants, but also in the Old Testament, we're told a new covenant is coming. And so the new covenant is coming, and then we have the rules that are associated with the new covenant. It would just make no sense. And you can eat, you can even see this. This is, in other words, this is in the New Testament, where the uh, the issue comes before the apostles in Acts 15, and it's, hey, which of these rules that are for the children of Israel actually apply to non-Jewish Christians? And they only come up with a couple of things that would have interfered with the fellowship between uh, Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. It was, it was, hey, you know, don't eat certain things in the presence of, uh, of Jewish believers because that's going to cause division. But it never crosses their mind. Oh, we have to follow all these things. All you, all, all these new Christians have to follow all of these. I didn't say that. You're strawmanning. I didn't say that Christians believe that you have to follow everything in the Old Testament and the Mosaic Law. You're strawmanning me. If I'm you're going to follow it on big things like going Christians, around killing people, that yeah, would be kind did, of a big they did one. Take that. Yeah, they did take that. They did? did take that from the Old Testament. Did Augustine, Augustine We're is not talking citing about Augustine here. It. Theodosius is citing it. All of the, Constantine is citing it. All of these other Christians throughout history are citing the Old Testament to justify expansionist war to because they they are looking for as Christians guidance on how to run. Uh, their state. They're trying to run society according to Christian values. You have this preposterous position that the Bible has nothing applicable to running a state. And I, can, about, I agree. You're talking about, me, you're talking about me strong. You're talking about me straw manning. I talked about how the church would influence governments and so on. But yes, if you're, if you're talking about the church Based on, uh, what going out, Jesus, going out and based on what teaching of Jesus did they just, 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 his, just to His kingdom is not of this world. What's that? I was going to say, just to hear the rest from David. What's that? Well, he cut me off, so... Oh, I, like, I agree. No, wait, I mean, it's it's like friend. roughly equal. This is where I'm like, just to be sure that it keeps going in a civil manner, I'm jumping in a little bit more now. So I'm not trying oh. to say anybody's doing oh, it more fine. than the other. And by the, by the way, Daniel, you, you're, free to, you're free to cut me off. I have no, no problems. It's a friendly discussion. Um, but it, Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. Uh, he establishes the church. You could have a nation of Christians. You could even have a, a, a nation um, grounded in Christian principles and so on. You can do all that. That's just, you're, you're kind of on new ground because that's not what you're commanded. And, and Christians for the first three centuries of Christianity don't seem to have a concept that they're supposed to be out there taking over the world. The time when you start to get ideas like that is after, after Christianity is combined with the Roman Empire and then you've got this Christian Roman hybrid. And then, of course, people within that empire start coming up with, uh, oh, here's why we have here's why we have to do it. Well, the, the, the only point here, there not there's nothing in your covenant that suggests that. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't and I don't know why we keep <laughs> why we keep going over this. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the, the the Christian perspective. The Christian perspective would have to be consistent with the new testament um if you're talking about hacking people up my goodness over and over again we're supposed to love everyone we're supposed to pray for everyone we're supposed to live in peace with everyone and you, you can't do that if you're going around hacking up apostates uh you know like muhammad told his followers to do i mean cite one christian authority prior jesus. to modernity prior to modernity jesus who has the same what? interpretation as you who has the same interpretation as you that you should let blasphemers just run wild in society, in Christian society. Name one Christian authority. Jesus. Okay. Chris, no, you are. This is a circular argument. The Jesus. whole question is interpreting what Jesus has said to rep. Because you're saying that again, don't uh, lift the sword is something that applies to all of society. 
But how is that possible? How can uh, that apply to all of society? Because invaders can come and annihilate the Christian nation if you take Jesus' statement, as you're doing, and apply it more widely to the societal level. That's the whole problem, David. And that's why no Christian, that's not why no Christian, you're the one to modernity, said never punish blasphemers. Blasphemers should have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Cite me one Christian authority who has this interpretation of Jesus' words. That's my question. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm giving you Jesus' <laughs> yeah, words. There is no one who comes after Jesus. You're not, you not Jesus, there, right? There so is no one who comes others after. Others have to interpret his words to understand what Jesus meant, right? So I want someone to corroborate I'm, your interpretation of Jesus' words prior I'm, to modernity. I'm not, I'm one not citation. In, I'm one not citation. interpreting. I I'm cited not, you many Christian authorities. I'm not who inter- have the inter- opposite interpretation of you. Who have the opposite interpretation of you? If they are not in line with the New Testament, then they they've got issues. And again, you don't start you don't start getting these guys. You don't start getting these guys until Christianity merges with the Roman Empire. So I understand where they got their ideas. The point is, if you're saying, "Hey, we need to go out and subjugate and build a Christian society and crush blas- uh, blasphemers," you just got no basis for that in Scripture. And that's that's a very simple point. So I mean, are you seriously saying I have to? So well, how about I this? To, I have to I have to establish society based on Theodosius, not on Jesus. It's a very, very strange idea. And I mean, di- didn't didn't you even agree that Jesus wasn't establishing a you know a, a society and so on? Yeah, I, I agree because that. because the Islamic understanding is Jesus is refining the Mosaic law. He's not abrogating it, so it still applies. But he is not there to introduce a new sharia, a new set of laws. He is trying to redirect the believers at that time towards a true message of worshiping God alone, because there had been a lot of tahrif, a lot of additions and corruption that had come. And that's the whole purpose of prophets over time. This is These are the prophets that come successively to remind people of the correct way to live life. And Jesus was among them, peace be upon him, and he's going to return, inshallah, he's going to return in the end of times to kill the Antichrist and to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is what we truly believe. Look, in Second uh, Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, what do you say about this? All scripture is God-breathed mm-hmm. and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So this is in the New Testament. And it's saying that all scripture is relevant, all scripture for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that confirms was, that, not only what I'm saying about the relevance of the Old Testament, it confirms all of these other Christian authors and authorities of the church who are also saying that. You're the only uh, one and this liberalized Christianity who has to distance yourself from the history of Christianity because it is not liberal and it's not secular. <laughs> and you just quoted the Apostle Paul, who is the champion of us not being under the Old Covenant. My goodness. Yeah, read, so read, that's, a, read, that's read, a problem for you. Read, read, read Galatians. It's only, I mean, Paul quotes the Old Testament left and right. Uh, Paul does not believe that Christians are supposed to go out and subjugate the world. So you're, you're, you're quoting a guy who certainly did not mean what you're saying yes paul believes that we can the 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 entire old testament is there for us to learn for us to use from us to learn from to say that we are actually under certain commands that were revealed and directed specifically towards a particular group goes against everything paul ever said and you're saying that it's a, it's a no, very... paul, paul is saying that you have to you have to uh you have to follow these commands that are directed towards the children of israel contradicts the entire message of paul I mean, the the point is that it's a very simple deduction. I tried to lay it out for you. Like uh, these Christians throughout history are looking to Moses and they see that Moses is one of the great prophets and he is engaging in expansionist war and God is uh, commanding him to do so. And so that means it's something legitimate. It's something that is not evil. It's not something that is prohibited. And so they take that as inspiration in order to do that themselves. That doesn't mean that they're literally following the Mosaic law. Well, I don't know. I don't know. To do. Again, if Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Um, and we're told 
uh, live in peace with all men, uh, honor all people, um, pursue peace with everyone. We're told this, and you interpret this as a call for expansionistic war. That is, I mean, that's just the sloppiest interpretation I can I can even imagine. You're cherry picking. Those are some verses from the New Testament, but what, what about the what rest the, of the Bible? The all the verses that I cited <laughs> in Deuteronomy, in Numbers, you you all can't. of the si- verses about Amalek, all the verses about Canaanites. The, I just read you the verses from Deuteronomy. <laughs> you want me to read them again? Those are uh, giving general rules about expansionist war. Jewish scholars all are, are no, agreed. Maimonides no, is agreed. Even, Augustine you, you, is agreed. Even, Constantine God, is agreed. God set the, the boundaries. God set the boundaries. You read a passage about fighting people far off. Why? Because there, there are situations when you fight people far off, right? The United no. States. The United States Why? can fight someone. The United States can fight someone far off. The United States can defeat someone far off. The United States can do that. Yeah, that's without, imperialism. Without taking over the world. Right? When, you, when, you, over the world. when you when you Jews someone, can fight someone far off. When God says, "Here's your borders," and then that's that's the borders that the Jews always used. And you're saying, "No, there's this verse that says you might fight someone." So it's talking about conquering the world. And then you say, "And since that's talking about conquering the world, when it clearly isn't, therefore." Christians who are commanded to love everyone, to pray for everyone, to honor all people, they have to say, well, now we have to be aggressively expansionistic, and we have to go out and conquer the world. And, and notice, all of this is like, I mean, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the, the point here? I mean, I quoted Jesus, I quoted the apostles, you're quoting Roman emperors and and telling us that's the Christian perspective, and I have to refute their respect. When I'm the one quoting Jesus and the apostles, and the entire time we're dodging the issue of Islam. And so, I mean, going to the point about attacking someone that's at a distance, how can that be defensive? If you are defending yourself against an invader or you're limited to a particular border that God has granted you this land from the Nile to the Euphrates, then if it's defensive, then people are at your border. They're not at a distance. Distance means you are offensively attacking a city. And that's exactly what the verse says. Look, Deuteronomy 20, verse 10, uh, it says, when you march up to attack a city, uh-huh. yeah. make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. If they refuse to make peace, then kill them all, basically. So this, you're is, saying, this is offensive war. So so when the United States goes and fights Germany and conquers Berlin, you're saying that that's aggressively expansionistic and not, hey, here's a threat to people and a threat to the world, and we're going to fight. It, it, if that's it, your it, definition, it, then how can you criticize Islam? Because Islam can have that idea of, preemptive warfare as, as well against the Persians, against the uh, Romans, against um, other well, it's, it's, people. That's also can be preemptive, just like the U.S. going to Germany. You're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not fighting people. You're not fighting people because uh, they're coming to attack, although that is, that is a reason in Islam to, to fight against people. But, I mean, when Muhammad says, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah, there you're fighting people because of what they believe. And, I mean, it's pretty clear Islam didn't expand from out of Arabia all the way across northern Africa up into Europe and then across uh, uh, in the other direction all the way out to India by defense, by defense. Um, and you, you know, I didn't claim it was defense. I was just using you're claiming that these verses in Deuteronomy are defensive, even though. It's no, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying they're I'm saying they're not trying. We have no indication that they were ever trying to conquer the world. That's what I'm saying. And so if God, said, if God says them, and Maimonides says, I gave God you all says, the evidence. Maimonides is saying that this is a command to conquer the entire world and to wipe out paganism, including Christianity. Maimonides uh, is saying this. There is an indication a very clear indication that uh, they interpreted this as expansionist war. And again, going back ta- to all of these, you're, you're emperors, talking, you're talking the about the church, you're talking the about the church, the Spanish, they you're all, talking about the medieval, the medieval philosopher Maimonides um, over and over and over again. And this is very strange. Imagine, I mean, just imagine, um, I trust I asked, his I, understanding of the Bible over yours. That's the, that's the point. I'm just going with what it says, and the fact that the Jews did not go around ex- expanding, conquering the world. They didn't do it. 
They didn't do yeah, it. Not for lack right. of the textual command to do so, and not for lack of the interpretation of those textual commands. Okay, apparently you could take so. any. Apparently you could just take any verse, and even though God says, "Here are your borders," and He gives uh, He gives bases for fighting other people, you can say, uh, "And the Jews are supposed to go out and conquer the world," um, and then Very Christians, big. and then Christians are supposed to follow that. And then Christians are supposed to ignore every command, every command directed towards them. Come on, this is this is massive amount of desperation. The idea that a Christian is supposed to say, you know what, I've been commanded, love everyone, love my enemies, um, uh, that I'm supposed to do good to everyone, pray for everyone, honor everyone, and this means that I'm supposed to follow. You the honor you Old honor Testament Christ. Christ. You honor mm -hmm. the do you honor the artist who made piss Christ? I said I said I said in my own I said in my opening statement that as far as that person is a uh, human being created in the image of God, that person is worthy of a certain level of love and respect. But that we do not have okay. to, uh, we do not have to uh, love what they do or honor what they do. We can we can condemn what they do, and rebuke them for what we do and tell them how horrible they are for what they do. But uh, there are certain things that that we. If given the opportunity, I wouldn't kill him. I wouldn't kill them. Um, yeah, well, I, because because that person's created in the image of God. Whereas I suspect, and we could, those of you who are uh, Muslims, the Canaanites are, were also those of you Muslims created in the are, image of God. The Amalek were also created in the image of God. The heretics that the Christian Church eradicated in the early centuries of Christianity, they were also created in the image of God. That didn't stop them from killing them. Um, if you're talking about Christians doing it, Christians had no Christians, yeah, Christians had no business. Doing, no. Christians, Christians had and Christians had no business doing the followers it. Followers of Moses. If you're talking about Moses again, that's a different situation. By the way, this is kind of a side note. Um, all the groups that you say were were genocided are are there later. You might want to do. A little I didn't easier. use the word genocide. You used the word genocide. Um, no, I heard you somewhere else use the word genocide. In this debate? Uh, no, in a clip you posted on on YouTube. Yeah, I'm not committed to the word genocide. If you want okay. to niggle over that, I mean, infants were being killed. Well, I mean, children mm, were being killed. That's what I'm the not, multiple that's what verses I mean. I'm not, say. That. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> now you're you're questioning the the interpret or the clear wording of the verse. Uh, th right? There's a there's a reason for that. Let, let me let me give you let me give you uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Um, but while you're getting that example, let me just say that. Yes, Islam is expansionist. In, in many videos, I have uh, defended this. I think Christianity has been expansionist. Judaism has been expansionist. It seems like all monotheistic faiths, Abrahamic faiths, have been expansionist. It's only these liberalized um, Christians like David Wood who take a, this kind of human rights interpretation of, of, the, of the Bible. But all of these religions have been expansionist. And the idea... Because I want to interpret the Old Testament in the most charitable way. I'm not endorsing everything because in the Old Testament because I think there's been corruption in it. But the idea of spreading the word of God and establishing true justice. You cannot have true justice without belief in God and submission to God. And this is the message in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's in the uh, Quran. And the idea is very simple. You want to establish the justice of God, and there is no justice when people are worshiping Satan, when people are worshiping uh, idols, false gods. And so this is something that has to be addressed in the world. And in Islam, this is something very clear in the Old Testament, in Judea, in the Orthodox Jewish tradition, this is something very clear. And in Christianity, it has been very clear. The only way that you can criticize Islamic expansionism is if you throw your entire tradition under the bus, all of these Christians throughout history under the bus. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't agree with Christian expansionism because it's spreading uh, idolatry, you know, this triune God, but I don't disagree with the practice or the method of spreading through expansion, through conflict. I don't, I'm not criticizing Christianity or Judaism because of the method. Yeah, I don't agree with the theology, but, you know, I'm very consistent on this. It's only David Unfortunately, you are inconsistent yeah, I, because I, you have I, to I, trash your entire tradition. The, you have to trash I'm the, the only one. I'm the only Christian in history who believes in human rights and uh, Christians. We got, you know, urine all over our walls and so on. And uh, the, welcome to uh, Daniel's understanding of uh, <laughs> of Christianity. Um, 
Now, let, let, me, let me give an example of what I'm talking about here. So here, here's one of the classic uh, exterminate, exterminate them passages. Don't leave alive anything that breathes. Um, so God says, and this is in uh, this is in Exodus 23, and you start to see the issue here where I'm saying I, I'm not sure about certain things. Um, so God says, verse 22, if you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. So this is the an extermination passage. God is going to wipe them out. Uh, verse 24, do not bow down to their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take sickness from among you and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. So this is like talking about the ongoing miracles and why these people are so responsible um, for rebelling against him. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals, animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I will establish your borders, and I've already quoted this, I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give into your hands the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. And so this is the point I'm making. Over and over and over again, in the Torah, you have these commands which talk about wiping people out. They're going to wipe them out. And God says he's going to wipe them out here, but then he explains what it means. I'm going to drive them out little by little over time. And this is something that you see over and over and over again, that we do... The way we use language, those mean two completely different things. Saying wipe out everything that breathes is very different from saying uh, drive someone off well, the land. Isn't Jesus the one who's commanding this, though? So where, how do you reconcile Jesus's apparently universal ethic about not raise, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But it's Jesus as part of the triune God in the Old Testament also saying, fine, let's, let me just concede the border issue and, and all of these little things that you're adding to uh, the interpretation, which is, again, not shared by other commentators. Uh, fine, let me concede all of that. Uh, it's still Jesus who's commanding wiping out all of these people uh, and or driving them, I should say, driving them out of their homes, driving them out. Uh, so how does that reconcile with live by the sword, die by the sword? Well, I mean, no, if you look, this is there, there's God's judgment on these people, right? I mean, the, the, the accusations against them are things like child sacrifice, bestiality, things like that. And God sends them a prophet, and for four why centuries— why, why, why isn't that tolerated? Why doesn't Jesus tolerate that? It's your, the, the, the uh, it, child sacrifice, okay, the, the babies that mm -hmm. are being driven out, the women that are being dry, driven out, mm -hmm. uh, they're all collectively responsible for some— that are doing child sacrifice in uh, in this uh, amongst these people, but they're all being driven out, right? By Jesus, why doesn't he tolerate? Where's the tolerance there? Yeah, you're 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 thinking I'm saying something I'm not. I'm not. You're thinking I'm saying never punish anyone. I mean, I said it very clearly in my opening statement. Have no problem with proper authorities uh, punishing people. I have no problem with with God wiping us out if we want. That was not the point of anything I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that the commands to wipe people out are used interchangeably with drive them off the land. And all of the groups, all of the groups that are supposedly wiped out, so that's the, the Canaanites, the Midianites, and the Amalekites, all the groups that are supposedly wiped out are all there afterwards. And so... Uh, the way scholars interpret this is they're, they're using language in a, in a very different way from what we're using it at. Again, I have no problem with, with scholars. That. I mean, I'm citing all of these scholars who say that it means wiping out. Look at, you know, all Western scholars. They say Philip Jenkins, for example, laying down the sword. They all say that this means no, 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 not, genocide. Not, not on this issue. Yeah, on the, on the Amalek, on the Canaanites, on, on these tribes that are mentioned in those verses that we keep citing. 
The, um, those are no, all I, about genocide, I'm according saying, to these Western scholars. I, no, you there, can say there's that an entire understand. there's an entire book by Paul Copan called "Did God Command Genocide?" where he goes through the issue. So the issue number one, which I mentioned, the command to completely exterminate are used interchangeably with commands to drive people off the land. So that should send up a flag. Wait a minute. Driving someone off the land is completely different from exterminating someone, and yet the Bible is using them interchangeably. That should make us think, hey, maybe there's something, maybe there's something going on here. But then we see this other pro this other issue where the people, the people who all the groups that are supposedly wiped out are there later. And sometimes it's in the same chapter. Like Joshua goes up, uh, he conquers Jerusalem, he wipes out the Canaanites, and then the Canaanites are there later in this in this in the same chapter. Uh, the Amalekites are supposedly wiped out. I mean you quote you quoted first Samuel the Amalekites are supposedly wiped out by Saul. They were down to the last. So you're, you're saying that there's no killing involved in this. They're just not, driven not, off. Not, the, what not, does not, driven not, off the land mean? Uh, I mean, this is a, such a ridiculous interpretation. Like, there's no, so many. Look at you, Numbers you, you, 21. You the destruction of King Sion and King Og. So they smote. They smote, and his son. Not saying that. Not saying. Og not saying son, there's no. Not all his saying. People. Not saying so there's, there's killing. No, not say, I'm not saying there's no I'm not saying there's no killing. So if you're saying there's killing, yes. Uh, as far as these groups being completely exterminated and all their children killed, I'm saying the Bible refutes that interpretation because the groups are still there. Later. I didn't I didn't make that interpretation. Right. I didn't use the word genocide. All I all I'm pointing out is that there's mass violence. There's mass killing. Okay. Mm -hmm. of, of children and infants. That's a, that, that's 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 where I'm that's where I'm having the problem. There's nothing there in Islam, by the way. There's no command in Islam. Except your, in the except your, except your God says that this is the inspired word of God. I mean, even, 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 what, what is even the, the even word the Quran. Word? When you said yeah, Jesus, I said defend that, everything in the Quran. I defend everything and stand by everything, every letter, every word in the Quran. No, you don't, because you, you said that Jesus came, and because uh, you know these problems arise when uh, the Quran says Jesus affirmed the Torah. That was Baina Yadehi. That's that means between his hands. So he's affirming the Torah between his hands. This doesn't sound like he's coming to correct it. When Muhammad says Baina Yadeh is not a literal expression. It is an expression that means the one what's with him. So he's bringing the Torah. He's bringing the reaffirmation the of the true, the true Torah that had been corrupted over time. Corrupted? This is Tahrir. Yes, doesn't, does, corrupted. doesn't Allah say that no one can change his words? No one can change this final revelation. No one can he doesn't say change. That. He says no one can change his do, words. Do you know what the preserved tablet is, David? Do you know Loh al Mahfud in Islam? Like you need to understand. He doesn't Islamic say theology. no one can change the preserved the Loh, tablet. That's he says his, no one can the change preserved his words. tablet is his words. That's where the Quran is from. Is the that's Torah where the his Torah, words? Yes, the Torah, the Torah is, is his preserved words. on the preserved tablet. On the Torah is his words in the heavens. It is preserved. No one can change his words on the preserved Loh al Mahfud. Mahfud. In Arabic means preserved. That's where the mm -hmm. Quran is from. That's where the Torah from, is from. That's where the Injil, the revelation to Jesus Christ, may Allah uh, peace and blessings be upon Jesus Christ. Those are all on the preserved tablet. Yes, they've been preserved by God Almighty and, and angels. No devil, no Satan can go and change his words. On earth, though, on pages, on material things, yes, those can be corrupted. In fact, it happens all the time. Christians are constantly, I'm sure you have your disagreements with many Christian denominations. Don't you think that they've corrupted the word of God because they are, you know, prosperity gospel or Joel Alstein or, or these some of these guys? You think those are those guys haven't corrupted the word of God? Uh, the text, no, and ne your God didn't believe that either. I mean, again, yeah, I, Muhammad, I just, Muhammad, Muhammad the, the tells the, Muhammad tells the Jews. So when Muhammad said, told the Jews, bring me a copy of the Torah, and they bring it out, you're saying they brought him the preserved tablet, and he said to the preserved tablet in heaven, even though he's pointing to the copy that they brought him, he says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you, and then in Surah five, verse forty three of the Quran when the Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute, and Allah says, why do they need you when they have the Torah? I mean, obviously, if the Torah has been corrupted, they do need Muhammad. Muhammad would need to correct the errors. And then just a few verses later, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. And then in 568, where Allah says, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord, 
Um, very strange if he's talking about standing upon the preserved tablet that you no longer have access to because it's been corrupted. And then in Surah 10, verse 94 of the Quran, when Muhammad is told, if you have doubts about what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. So that makes no sense if he's telling people to go to, I mean, if he's telling Muhammad himself that he can only confirm his revelations You're by just... going to the Jews. I mean, Muhammad again pointing to a copy that they have, and then when Muhammad, uh, in terminating, when Muhammad is uh, was was uh, said that knowledge is going to depart from his people, and the response was, "What are you talking about? We have the Torah. How can knowledge depart from us?" And Muhammad says, "What are you talking about? The Jews and Christians have the Torah and the Gospel, don't they? That makes no that makes no sense if we've had corrupt books, because he's saying knowledge is going to depart from you, even though you have." the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. And so if he's saying, well, the Jews have it, and knowledge has departed from them, that means they've got the, they've got the Torah. So to look at all Jesus of this and say, it. nope, it's been corrupted, Daniel, I mean, I, I had a lot of, I mean, I've had a lot of respect for you from, from, from you not denying what Islam says about, you know, beating, yeah, yeah. you know, beating women. Well, I appreciate and, that. And I appreciate that respect. I, 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 I appreciate yeah, that. I said, but there, your, your whole problem is you don't but, understand. There's a difference. Your whole problem, David, is, and I thank you for the respect, but your whole problem is that you don't understand figurative language. <laughs> I mean, these are not contradictions. This is figurative I believe in language. you and in the one who revealed you. That's figurative? Yeah, the Torah. It's referring to the Torah, not literally this book. A copy of the Torah. Yeah, a copy that could be corrupted. And, and your whole argument is moot because you don't know what was in that copy. <laughs> so it's, it's just uh, a straw man. <laughs> Okay. Got just a this couple is more 2,000 years later, 2,000 years after the revelation, 2,000 years after the revelation, and the Jews still had a reliable copy, and yet others have somehow been corrupted. Very, very, very no, no, uh, that's, strange I didn't stuff. say that that's, what has, that's a possibility. The other more likely possibility is that this is figurative language. The prophet, peace be upon him, is referring to the preserved Torah, the original Torah that was revealed, not literally that one copy that he didn't even open. Uh, I mean, he says, bring me a copy and then and then talks to the copy and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. I'll, I'll just yeah. say that. I'll just I'll just I'll just say this. It's a profound statement. If, it's a profound if, statement from the prophet to confirm his belief and his uh, um, allegiance to the Torah and all the other revelations from God. That's a strong, powerful I would, statement, but you're you interpreting me, it in the most uncharitable way and trying to make a big deal about it. I'm assuming like, oh, he needs what he says. I'm assuming he needs what he says. Yeah, I, he, needs yeah but there's something called figurative language. There's something called, in human language, David, there's something called figurative yeah. language where it doesn't mean literally this and that. I have I, a very charitable interpretation of the verses that I'm reading from you when you say that, oh, it's not referring to children. It means driving them out. I conceded many of those points. Mm -hmm. I'm just... And, and showed, like, it's still a problem, it's still a contradiction. But I was charitable with your citing of the verses of the Bible, because you know more about the Bible than I do. But I know more about the Quran than you do. So be charitable likewise. Stop bringing these Christian sound bites that we've heard a million times and that no uh, Muslim takes seriously and no, under, no uh, scholar of Islamic studies takes seriously, by the way. Um. No, there there are scholars of Islamic studies who who take this very seriously. If you want to, uh, if if you want to, if you want to take a look, um, but no, I agree with you about figurative language, and I'm and I'm open to it. Uh, but there has to be a good reason to accept the figurative language. Like when we read, "Hey, this group was exterminated," and then the group is there later, then we might want to try and figure out something that's going on here. And scholars actually say that this was a common form of hyperbole, hyperbolic language. In the ancient world, we even have it not just we. Did, it's not just from the Jews. It's all all of those cultures around there who are writing about their victories. They described a military victory or a, a something of uh, pushing someone off the land or dethroning a king. They described Time. it in their writings as the complete extermination of civilizations. There, there are even writings that describe a victory over the the, the children of Israel in that way. Into the Q and A. What's Pardon that? my interruption. We got to jump into the Q and A. Oh wait, wait, wait. Can, can I just finish that point real quick? I'll be sure. I'll it. be super quick. I'll be super quick. Um, so I'm I'm open to uh, figurative language. Uh, the problem uh, the, the the problem I, I was pointing out with with the Quran is everything I see from the Quran insists upon the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Quran, and everything I see in the Hadith that actually comes from Muhammad uh, insists upon the inspiration, 
uh, preservation authority of not just the Quran, but also the Torah and the gospel. And so I have no reason to take it as figurative. If it is figurative, I'd have to say Allah and Muhammad were very bad communicators, just as if I went with your interpretation of Jesus and you know Moses and so on, I'd have to conclude that uh, they were very bad communicators. We've got to jump into the Q&A, but do want to mention, folks, a couple of things. First, our guests are linked in the description. We are going to go through as many questions as we possibly can. We have occasionally a comment in there as well. But do want to remind you, hit that like button if you've enjoyed it so much. As I've got to tell you, David and Daniel, this has been such a huge response from the audience in terms of questions as well as just enjoyment and likes. I don't know if we've ever had this many likes so far in a live debate. But anyway, we're going to jump into it. Thanks very much for your first one. One more Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. James. Uh, I wanted to make a request if it's okay with David. Can we like have just five minutes, like a closing statement before we get into the questions, like for each of us, just to wrap up? I'm, op- I'm okay with that. It sounds like Dan- David is as well. So let's do that. I'll start the timer for five minutes. And let's see if I remember right. Oh, you mean now? Yeah, before the Q&A, if that's okay with you, David. Yeah, and, sure, sure, sure. I sure, can sure. go first or, or you can go first. It's, it's- uh, go ahead. I was not anticipating a <laughs> a five minute. Go ahead, Daniel. The floor is all yours for five minutes. Okay. So I want to say, look at the cops in Egypt. Cops are Christians in Egypt. They have been practicing Christianity for 1,400 years under Muslim rule. Look at the Christian Palestinians. Look at the Christians in Lebanon. Look at Christians throughout the Muslim world. I'm not going to say that Islamic law gives full religious freedom to these Christians because that's not true. There are restrictions and there are good reasons for them. Again, we don't do not believe in this liberalized individualistic notion of tolerance. But the point being, after 1400 years, Copts in Egypt still believe in Jesus as God. They still have their religious rituals. They still have their community. They still have their traditional families. Compare that with Christians in the U.S. and Europe under secular rule. Thousands of churches are closing permanently. There's unprecedented mass apostasy. Christian schools are being forced to teach their kids in uh, LGBT and all matter of things that fundamentally contradict Christian values. Christianity is not going to survive in any recognizable form under liberal secular rule, the same kind of values that David has been preaching. And it's only been 200 years of dominant liberal secularism. Whereas under Islam, in contrast, Christians and and others lived and thrived for 1,400 years. How ironic that some Christians like David Wood believe Islam to be their biggest threat, when in reality it is human rights liberalism that's destroying their religion right in front of them, destroying their communities, destroying generation after generation and their entire way of life. And unfortunately, it's doing this to Muslims as well. So I want to first and foremost invite Christians to Islam. Let's fight this monster together. As Muslims, we have our criticisms of Christian theology, but we love Jesus Christ more than life itself. We recognize that he is the Messiah, which means that his time for establishing God's rule on earth was not in the past, but in the future, when he will return with great wrath and fury to kill the Antichrist. And once and for all, stamp out rebellion and disbelief in God Almighty. Jesus will have the final victory over the enemies of God. And as Muslims, we're eagerly awaiting his triumphant return so that we can join him and we can support him. So I invite Christians to become Muslim, but if Christians don't want to do that, then at least let's be allies or at least recognize the bigger threat to all of humanity, which is liberal secularism. Uh, I also want to say that, um, David, uh, on a more personal note, in one of your videos, you mentioned that you have uh, some of your sons have certain disabilities. And uh, that that really hit me hard because I have sons as well. And I know that one of the most difficult pains we can experience in this life is our children uh, being ill. So, you know, I really lift my hands in in prayer sincerely to pray to God Almighty to heal uh, and protect your sons, David and also to make them a source of guidance for you and your family. And I pray that um, that guidance uh, will be the gate um, for all of you uh, to paradise, to be in eternal paradise together. That's my sincere hope uh, for all Christians. Uh, Amen. Amen. You got it. Thank you very much for that closing statement. We'll kick it over to David for his as well. All right. Well, uh, thank you for the uh, kind thoughts there, Daniel. And, uh, uh, I, I do have to say, um, 
I know there are lots of people who, who think of Daniel as this uh, horrible monster, and I do really, really disagree with um, some of Daniel's uh, views on, you know, beating wives into submission and, uh, you know, the various reasons for fighting people and so on. I disagree uh, with him on those, but I meant what I said in my introduction that it's as, as long as we're, we're, we're trying to be truthful and uh, not, not lying about things and we're trying to get to the bottom of things, um, you can disagree with me wi widely on a lot of issues. And again, my view is that you're created in the image of God. Uh, you're all worthy of a uh, a certain degree of respect, and that provides the foundation, the basis for any conversations uh, we might want to have. Uh, you, you did say that um, Christianity will not survive what's been going on here. Um, historically, this is called the, the pendulum. The, the, there's the idea that a pendulum swings way out in one direction and then things swing back. I just want to say, Daniel, if you're worried about you know, the, the threat of liberalism. There are certain things that liberalism gets right. And like, like any good thing, you could, you could have too much of it. But uh, each century has its problems that it has to deal with. And each century looks at the problems that it's dealing with and says, ah, this is going to destroy everything. This is the end of the world. And it just doesn't. It just doesn't. And so once things tend to start going too bad for society because it has some, some sort of bad ideas, uh, things start swinging in the other direction. So I, I don't believe that, that you know, Christianity is going to end um, anytime soon. Uh, you said we believe that Islam is the biggest threat. Actually, I just wanted to correct. No, I don't. I don't believe that Islam is the biggest threat anymore. If there was a time when I did. I'm much more concerned about things like uh, big tech right now. Uh, and so I actually have more concerns about some other things than Islam. Uh, but when it comes to Islam, um, I do have my objections. Uh, it, Muhammad did call for the violent subjugation of the world. Muhammad did uh, command his followers to kill apostates, to kill critics. And it, it, it is my view as a Christian, this is Old Testament and New Testament, that human beings are created in the image of God. Um, I am commanded as a Christian to love everyone, uh, even my enemies, uh, even people who hate me, even people who despise me. As I pointed out, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't rule out judgment from proper authorities. Um, and as I've, as I've stated, I believe that God has the authority to give life and take life. So the problem is not with um, God killing people or executing people or things like that. It's uh, how do you know you're actually hearing from God? I've never seen any reason to think that Muhammad was speaking uh, for God. So this isn't simply liberalism versus Islam. This is uh, a Judeo-Christian perspective on not listening to false prophets. I see no reason to believe in Muhammad at all, and therefore no reason to accept his commands about beating women, about enslaving people, about taking sex slaves, uh, about violently subjugating the world. And it's just dangerous to have someone who uh, claims that he's been commanded to subjugate the world and there's no reason to believe it. you can't do that. You just can't you just can't accept what someone says because they say, hey, look at my lovely Arabic prose. And so uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say your, your overall argument was that Christians are inconsistent from criticizing Muhammad for violence. Uh, I doubly reject that. Uh, on the one hand, we're not inconsistent because even the situation in the Old Testament is very different from the situation in Islam. Uh, Moses came accompanied by miracles. Uh, it wasn't just the Jews who were aware of the miracles. The unbelievers were aware of the miracles. And so anyone who's rebelling is rebelling against the Almighty. Very different situation from what we have with Muhammad. And the other reason I'm not consistent is I have to go with the commands of Jesus that are directed towards me, Jesus and the apostles. I'm commanded to love everyone, uh, to do good to everyone, to live in peace with everyone. And so when someone comes along and claims to be in the same line uh, with that and doesn't give some very, very good evidence, but he's contradicting the commands in every possible way, uh, I have to say, no, sorry, you're a false prophet. 
We'll jump into the Q&A, but do want to remind you folks a couple of things. One, our guests are linked in the description. We highly encourage you to click on their links if you'd like to hear more and also have to let you know we cannot take any more new questions, folks. We do have to get the Q&A wrapped up by a decent time. And so just warning you that any questions that come into the live chat at this point, there's just no way that we can get to them. In fact, I don't think we can get to all the questions that we have on the list. So we're going to start right now. Here we go with appreciate it. Sugarcoat says, or pardon me, there was first one was Anam Yamau says, David, why did God instruct the Israelites to stone apostates to death they suspected were serving other gods in Deuteronomy 17? I smell hypocrisy. Not hypocrisy, not hypocrisy at all. Uh, you would have to interpret me as saying that uh, God has no right to uh, execute apostates or something like that. Um, not what I'm saying. If you look at that situation, if you are taken out of the land of slavery, you're taken through the Red Sea, God sends food from heaven upon you to sustain you. Um, you are, are guided by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. You're led into the promised land. And then even after you build a temple, God descends upon the temple, fills it with his presence. God is performing ongoing miracles. God is sending prophets. Um, if that's happening, now if you're an atheist, you don't believe that that stuff happened, but if you're taking the scripture as what happened, then there's no excuse. There's no excuse. In other words, it's this idea that um, your responsibility is proportional to the uh, clear clearness of the revelation that you've been given. If a pillar of fire is standing there saying, do not speak in the name of other gods. Do not do that sort of thing. Do not, do not, do not uh, go around promoting apostasy here. Again, if you didn't want to follow the revelations, the border was right over there. Go, go somewhere else. But if you're there and you're staying there, and it's clear where these revelations are coming from, and it's indisputable that this is from the Almighty, and you say, I don't care, uh, I'm okay with God, God giving harsh judgments. Uh, I don't see that in Islam. And fortunately for everyone who's concerned, you don't see that a lot. Uh, you don't see that in the world today. I believe that God has given us uh, plenty of evidence that he exists. I believe that we've got plenty of evidence that Christianity is true. But you don't have that sort of immediate presence of God clearly as a warning that you'd better not uh, disobey him there. If, if it were, if God were here in all his glory, and told us to do something, and you said no, eh, I believe that God has the right to uh, to take you out. You got it. This next one coming in, oh, by the way, we have an occasional comment in here too, but this one for Daniel says, if you had to choose between supporting Al-Qaeda and supporting the secular liberal USA, which one would you choose? Please answer honestly. Oh, these are both terrorist actions. We'll look at all the destruction that the US has caused, killing millions of people around the world throughout its history. Uh, much more than terrorist groups. I denounced Al Qaeda. I denounced ISIS. These are terror groups. They are. Uh, there's arguably a lot of evidence to show that they are actually working for uh, certain intelligence agencies from Western countries. Uh, so I denounce all of these groups. And I mean, this is a false choice. It's like saying, uh, do you prefer uh, one type of poison or another? I don't have to address a false choice like that. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your, this one, a comment says, Aftab Khan says, Daniel for the win, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, says, Inshallah. What does Inshallah mean? Uh, if God wills. You got it. And thank you very much for this one. And on, oh, we got that one. The Super Destroyer says, apostasy law isn't a divine law. A lot of scholars like Sufian al Thari didn't think apostates should be given capital punishment. There is a lot of nuances to it. Don't you know that, David? Um, I'm assuming Daniel would actually agree with me on this one. Uh, but, yeah, Muhammad yeah. said if anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. You have, you know, like Muhammad Hijab says, maybe it means, uh, you know, you can exile them, or, or you know, maybe, maybe that would be an alternative. And you have, I've seen Muslims who say that, this only refers to um, you if you're you're sort of publicly announced, you know, going around spreading your apostasy. But uh, yeah, I, I interpret it. I interpret it. I interpret Muhammad's words as meaning, at the very least, in an Islamic state, that you would be executed for 
apostasy, whether you could do it on a personal level. Hey, that guy just left Islam. Let me go. Let me go chop chop him up. Um, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about that one. But uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm assuming Daniel would, would agree with me on, on this one. Yeah, I agree. Like, there's no difference of opinion. The only difference of opinion on apostasy is uh, some claim that uh, you have, uh, you would be in prison for life. So if someone apostates, it doesn't matter if it's public or if it's private, if someone hears you, then you've left the religion, then you have three days basically to repent. If you if you don't do so, then it's capital punishment. That's the majority of Islamic scholars throughout history have said that. The only difference of opinion is some minority said it's life in prison for the apostate. And I have videos explaining the moral justification of this type of um, command from God. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Jonathan Valentine. Thank you very much. Says Daniel mentioned a Quran verse or a Hadith that says, kill all the men. What about Sinan Ibn Majah 2541, where it was commanded to check boys for pubic hair? Isn't that killing all men by Islamic standards? Also, is it okay to look at children, private parts, if you want to decide to kill them? Uh, no, this is uh, referring to Banu Qurayza. So this was the Jewish tribe that uh, when the... Quraysh, basically the um, polytheists were invading and sieging the Muslims and surrounding them at all sides. There was this plan and agreement with the Jewish tribes, specifically Banu Qurayza, to hold the flank basically or hold the rear and not allow the enemies to get through the rear to attack the Muslims, surround them and annihilate Muslims. And the uh, Banu Qurayza basically reneged and they committed this kind of treason which put the Muslim nation, the early Ummah, in an existential threat where they're going to be annihilated. So the punishment for treason uh, in all legal systems, actually, not only Islam, but also in Judaism and Christianity, is execution. So the males were executed. It wasn't the children. Uh, children the, the point of checking if they had reached puberty is so that they wouldn't kill the children. Uh, and they, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked... Um, one of the Jewish soldiers, like, what is the appropriate punishment according to the Old Testament? And this uh, this person said that it would be execution for, for all, and, and so that's what happened. Punishment fits the crime. Gotcha, and this one coming in from, do appreciate your question, Q Malte, uh, Maltehi says, for David, you're on record cross-dressing because you misinterpreted a hadith. Are you actually... A closeted cross-dresser. Um, I mean, that was supposed to be a, a, a comedy video, but I don't know if you mean, I don't know if, what you mean with closeted cross-dresser. I did it in video. <laughs> I did it in video. If you mean, do I do it in private? No, I don't. <laughs> um, if you're talking about, uh, will I publicly make fun of something going to some extreme methods? Yes, uh, I'm happy to when I'm making, trying to make some kind of point. And, and, and for the record, I'm kind of joking in that situation. Uh, there are the, there are these passages that talk about um, uh, Muhammad, and it'll say that he was in Aisha's mert or thalb. Mert, mert does mean dress. Uh, thalb just means uh, garment. Uh, then there are Muslims who say this means this in this situation means blanket, or maybe she had her garment wrapped around him or something like that. Uh, I'm I'm fine with any of that. It is consistent to say. I mean, you could interpret it to mean that he was actually, you know, prancing around in her nighty. But again, I'm, I'm not glued to that interpretation. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of I'm kind of joking. And this is a situation when people constantly send you messages saying they're going to, uh, you know, slaughter you. They're going to rape your wife. They're going to rape your mother. They're going to kill your kids. Eh, sometimes you just kind of you got to lighten up and, uh, and, and kind of make fun of them. You got it. And this one coming in from, do appreciate it. This is a two-parter in a row for you, David. Rum Runner says, Jesus himself committed violence in John 2.15. And then Oflamio follows up by saying, was it wrong for Jesus to beat the money changers? Um, I don't think he actually beat the money changers. If you, if you, if you, you have multiple passages on Jesus cleansing the temple, but it says he, it says he made a whip and, and drove them out. But if you look, apparently the, he, the whip was to drive out the animals. He wasn't just driving out the, the people. He was driving out the, 
uh, animals as well. But you have to you, you have to line up the the various passages in the Gospels uh, to see to see what's going on. You got it. And this one from Azri, Schizophrenia says, For Daniel, if people are punished for insulting Muhammad, then do you agree people should be punished for being, mu- let me know if I pronounce this right, Musiric, M-U-S. Musiric? That's right. Thank you. Okay. Wait, they're, sorry, they're punished for being, is insulting Muhammad or being Musiric? No, they said, uh, if people are punished for if they are punished for insulting Muhammad, then do you agree people should also be punished for being mushrik? I, I don't know what that's referring to, but I, I just stated the um, position, Islamic position on apostasy, the Islamic position on blasphemy. And this is critical. If you let blasphemy run rampant in your society, also, if you let pagan idol worship run rampant in your society, then this is something that will... Uh, take faith out of your society. It will create a nation of apostates. It'll create a nation of evildoers and and the wicked, as it says in the Old Testament. And so you have to have strong deterrence against um, those kinds of acts of disbelief. And Islam does have strict regulations on this, including capital punishment. And there's very good reason for this. We want to preserve people's faith in God. That is something, the most valuable thing, Uh, in existence is your faith in God Almighty and the Creator and not associating partners with Him. So Islam as a complete system that is meant to last the test of time until the Antichrist is allowed to come by God, um, it, it has these kinds of rules of preservation. Christians also understood the Bible as giving them the authority to kill blasphemers, to attack the pagans offensively and to wipe out their altars, to wipe out their symbols. This is attested to in the Old Testament and the Christians throughout history up until the modern period for 1700 years, arguably even longer, interpreted these verses of the Bible as meaning to preserve faith by attacking uh, paganism and blasphemy, and they didn't see any contradiction between that interpretation and what they read in the New Testament from Jesus, because after all, Jesus says that he affirms the Old Testament, and he's not there to abrogate the law, he's there to confirm the law, as as is mentioned in the Bible. They didn't see a contradiction with that. It's only David Wood and liberalized modern Christians who have this bizarre interpretation that throws the Old Testament under the bus throws um, all of this Christian history under the bus. If, if Christians are okay with that and adopting this kind of pacifist, non-interventionist kind of plos- uh, uh, position towards blasphemy, then that just means the Christian nation cannot exist and it will be exterminated. And unfortunately, that is must what's happening. It. Must move. This one comes in from Anan Yamaus for David. says, why does the Bible say that Dawood, as a prophet, had relations with a married woman, why then was he not killed as per Leviticus 20? Um, you're, you're assuming that they always uh, followed the laws um, and that they always carried out uh, the punishments and so on. They didn't. And the uh, there, there's a mistake here that Muslims often make uh, and I think it's related to just taking everything Muhammad did and assuming that it's it's all good and so on, and defending everything Muhammad did and assuming that that you know Muhammad was right and all these you know whatever he did. Uh, that's not the, the biblical perspective of a prophet. The biblical perspective of prophets is that they are fallen, sometimes messed up human beings that God uses anyway, in spite of themselves, um, to get a message across to people. And so they can be praised for uh, certain aspects of their lives, like David is praised for being a man after God's own heart. You see this especially when he's young. Uh, But over and over and over again, we see even good kings uh, being corrupted over time. And fortunately, with someone, you know, like David, he repents, he repents afterwards. But uh, it's common in Islam to, to look at bad stories about prophets doing something bad and say, ah, why would they make this sort of thing up? Uh, They're not. Uh, And in fact, that's a testament to the 
uh, the trustworthiness of the authors of scripture that they're writing down even the faults and the misdeeds and the sins of even their heroes and exposing them. And so you can be like David in terms of being a man after God's own heart, uh, but y you need to watch out that if you get in a position of power, you don't abuse that. And that's something that's something you can see in both Christianity and Islam, because we both see uh, our religious, you know, religious leaders and preachers and so on fall into horrible sin. And, and that, that would be the takeaway message um, of David falling into sin. You got it. And Stop Scamming Man says, To Daniel, women are only 10% of the world's prisons populations. Nope. Yet, in so many hadiths, it says the majority in Jahannam are women. Why is this? The majority of the prison population? Or 10%? Women's prison population is 10%. So how does that relate to Jahannam? I, th I think I think I'm not gonna, I'm not going to comment. I'm just going to I think what the I think what he's saying is, if according to Muhammad, most of the inhabitants of hell are women, why is only 10 percent of the prison population women? Doesn't that suggest that women are actually better better behaved than men? Some I think that's the point that the person is trying to to get to. <laughs> You know the questioner, David? Or this is, no, no idea. Have you heard this question before? I've never heard this question before. I, think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I guess uh, if, I, uh, yeah, we'll give you a chance to respond, Daniel. Yeah, so I mean, I don't see the connection. Uh, these, you can have, you know, a lot of people getting away with all kinds of crimes according to the secular legal system that's created. The secular legal system doesn't punish all kinds of behaviors that are um, terrible enormities in the eyes of God. And so what God punishes in the afterlife is a separate question than what secular authorities punish in this worldly life, especially in a secular liberal country. But as for the majority of women being a part of the hellfire, there's a lot of different interpretations of this hadith. I think that even if we take the you know literal interpretation of the hadith, it's not a problem because there could be many reasons why one sex is um, committing more problematic things and sins and disbelief than the other sect. Um, there could also be one interpretation of there's just more women in the world. Women are the majority in many countries. Historically, I don't know if there's been more women than men, but it can also just be a simple matter of population discrepancy between males and females. Uh, this is one amongst many other different interpretations that can be given, but it's there's no contradiction. I don't feel any kind of you know problem with that hadith. Next one from the Super Destroyer says, David, why when you add the passages in Genesis, you get that Rebecca was three when she got married, and this is the opinion of scholars for centuries, even today, Rabbi. Chaim Mintz acknowledges that she was three. Uh, it, he would have to be an idiot to conclude that. Um, I, I would want to see evidence that that's not a, a fabricated person because there's no way you would read, there's no way you would read Genesis and conclude that. Uh, she's clear, I mean, she's working when, um, when Abraham's servant actually uh, gets out there. She's actually, you know, she's a, a, a she's a, a shepherdess on her own. If she's three years old, that makes no sense. The mis the mistake, the mistake that anyone who who makes this argument makes is there's a verse which says, and they heard that Abraham had a relative named Re Rebecca born, and so the the argument is well, right when Abraham heard it. That means that that's when she was born right there. And then they start doing math. Now, the ridiculousness of this is Abraham is a far, a long, long way away from his relatives. They don't have the Internet. They don't have a telephone. Um, so to conclude that as soon as she's born, that's when he hears it is ridiculous. You can hear it. I mean, if you think about when you'd get messages from so far away from home, you'd get messages every several years when a traveler's coming through uh, and says, here's a message, Here, here's the news from back home. Um, so it's a it's a silly argument, and the, the, the real reason for it is 
there are people who don't like criticisms against Muhammad for having sex with a nine-year-old girl, and so they try to, to argue that the Bible uh, teaches that Rebecca was three even again. There's no reason based on the passage to conclude that when Abraham heard about Rebecca, that's right when she was born, like that day. That's, that's ridiculous. She could have been 10, she could have been 15 when Abraham finally heard news from back home. And, but unfortunately, you have to make that assumption in order to get this to work. The problem is, given the description of, uh, of Rebecca and her interaction with people, she would have to be the most precocious three-year-old in all of human history. If she's, if she's three and she's already working and she's talking to her family and having the kind of discussions that she's having, uh, she would have to be the most precocious three-year-old in history. So, so guys, stop using this, this really bad argument. If you, if you want to attack the Bible, then attack the Bible, but, but don't be dishonest when you do it. This one from Friendly Ex-Muslim with a comment saying epileptic epileptic prophet series explains Muhammad's strange behavior. Thanks for that. And then Has Hesiotus Quidatus, thank you for your question, says, Daniel, are you confident enough in your belief to be willing to have another debate with David on a topic like, quote, was Muhammad a true prophet? Well, we'll see. I don't know if David is interested. We can talk about future debates. This but, one coming yeah. I mean, this debate that we had, I don't think we, uh, David addressed many of the points that I made. He didn't address the questions or answer the questions. We didn't even get to the Christian governance question or the politics of Jesus question. We touched on them, but I still don't have answers. So we'll see what future debates will hold. This one from Abu Mehanan, thank you very much, it says, For David, you speak of the image of God, but in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul claims only men are created in the image of God and women are subjugates of men. So does this apply, or does this only apply for men? Uh, no, abs- <laughs> no, 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 he doesn't. Um, Paul says that, that Adam was created first and so on, things like that, but, I mean, Paul's not going to go against Genesis chapter 1, which says that God created man in his image, male and female, he created them. So, no, uh, men and women are created in the image of God. You got it, Dan. This one coming in from Stop Scamming Man says, Hello, Daniel. In your estimation, should Abu Bakr, Bak- is it Bakir, B-A-K-R, have been impeached for burning gay people to death? I'm not aware of any narration that mentions that. In fact, burning people to death is not a punishment within Sharia. It's not an acceptable punishment within Sharia. So I'm not even aware of what that is referring to. Gotcha. The super destroyer strikes again and says, why did Jesus in Matthew 15, 26, call a woman a dog based on her ethnicity because she's not a Jew? Is that the sinless, tolerant Jesus? Jesus healing her later is irrelevant. Jesus healing uh, healing her later is I- irrelevant. Uh, no, it's not. Um, if you look, if you look at what's going on, the, the this this goes back to the Old Testament, and it's the this was a Canaanite woman. So the Canaanites, who were supposedly wiped out, um, became servants in Israel, and this woman is a descendant uh, from them. Um, Jesus, it's, it's actually puppy, right? Like the, the, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're their puppy. Um, but yeah, he's pointing out, Hey, your official status is, is as a, a puppy. And so why should I be giving you the blessing? And she says, yeah, but even the puppies get, uh, f- get the crumbs from their master's uh, table. And this is part, if you, if you actually look at the broader context of what Jesus keeps doing, he keeps showing that the non-Jewish, the Gentiles, have greater faith than a lot of the, a lot of the Jews. He'll show that there are certain, there, there, are, there are Roman leaders who have greater faith than some of the Jews, that there are, uh, you know, pagan Canaanites who have greater faith than some of the Jews. So there are people who are rejecting him, and yet these these pagans are, these pagans, these polytheists, um, are coming to the Messiah uh, because they understand that he's uh, he's performing miracles and so on. So, 
Um, yeah, Jesus, Jesus does this over and over where he'll say something that, that is uh, offensive to someone. He gets their reaction, and then he it turns out he's actually making uh, a point to the people around him. You got it. And Greg Kanowitz, thanks for your question, said, what did your Sharia law say to do to LGBTQ? How is that for violence? Disgusting. I'll give you a chance to answer. Yeah, we have the same position as found in the Old Testament <laughs> regarding uh, same-sex behavior. Just refer to Leviticus, refer to Deuteronomy, and you'll see exactly what Islam, Islam, the Sharia's position is on same-sex behavior. Uh, yeah, it's an intolerant position. <laughs> you know, we can call it intolerant, but it's, you know, this is exactly what we learn from Sodom and Gomorrah. This is exactly what we learned in the Quran about Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah. Uh, the story is repeated in um, in the final revelation of the Quran, and this is something that you know all God fearing Christians really should reflect on. Um, what have you done to resist what has become modern Sodom and Gomorrah in the world today? And are you not afraid that God will bring down a tremendous calamity like He did on Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, for our tolerance of this kind of, of behavior that has, has spread and is now in your schools, it is in your home, it is on your TV, it is on the internet, everywhere. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah is, is there and you have allowed it. Unfortunately, Christians, I'm talking to you, you're the majority, you had the moral authority within these Western nations, but you conceded all of that, uh, unfortunately, to liberal secularism. And part of it is because of uh, guys like David Wood, who just roll over and, you know, basically say we're we're the real human rights defenders as Christians. Like this is what has caused the earth to now become Sodom and Gomorrah. Muslims, on the other hand, we've been trying to resist this. We've been trying to uh, prevent um, the world falling into this pit of vice and, and sin. Uh, but I'm not like David Wood. I actually think that we are in the end of times. I think that the emergence of the Antichrist is imminent, and it's because of these things that have been allowed to happen by the secular liberal monster that's consuming the entire world. I just wish that, okay, Christianity, Christians, let's must. you know not forget about the past. Now it's time to really step up and stand for true values true family values, true values of marriage Just and because we have temperance and propriety. Why are you attacking Muslims on this issue? Why? It's in your Bible. You got it. This one from Zach Halilovic. Thank you very much. It says, for David, could you clarify how Christian tradition laid out a system of governance to deal with problems such as violence and intolerance based off of a biblical verses? If it is not clear, isn't that a problem? Um, no, again, it, it's it's not uh, it, it's it's not the same as the mindset in Islam, where you get this set of rules that you are supposed to impose on a society. Um, Christians spread their their ideas about other human beings and how we're supposed to uh, treat other human beings and how we're supposed to have love and have concern and seek peace with other people. And they spread the ideas and these things influence the government uh, and eventually you get governments that uh, that have more respect for human life and so on and again the, the examples i gave in my opening statement this happened over and over and over again even in the roman empire i mean they're they're the the main form of entertainment in the roman empire was uh watching people hack each other up and Christians thought that this is this is disgusting. These are people who are created in the image of God. God loves these people, and you're making them hack each other up. And so that happened um, again, infanticide, things like that. And so you do see how it's how it's influencing uh, the entire it's, and it's influenced the entire world because everyone, pretty much everyone, agrees with this now. Um, that 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 would be bad. It would be bad to have people uh, hacking each other up for entertainment. Almost everyone agrees with that now. Where did that come from? How did it go from being 
the favorite form of entertainment, right? You, I mean, men, women, and children all cheering as people are hacking each other up to something that would be disgusting to almost anyone nowadays. I mean, we have, you know, MMA fights and stuff like that, but uh, they're, not ha- they're not brutally hacking people up or having animals fight with people and having the animals eat the people and so on. So uh, the, the idea here is these ideas spread to everyone, whether you're Christian or not. And so... Uh, that's again it's not going out and, and conquering and subjugating the world um the jesus came and he establishes the church and the church has its rules that people are supposed to follow as far as the re- the rest of the world uh you 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 want them to get some points about loving other people even if they reject the message and that's that's exactly what happened you got it. This one from Apostate Prophet says, For Daniel, if you had to donate $1,000 to either David Wood or Osama bin Laden, whom <laughs> would you choose? Hey, you said Apostate Prophet? Yeah, that's Ooh. your buddy. Your old buddy, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, ah, these people. Ah, I didn't take my anxiety medication. Oh, Ooh, ah, man. Sorry, Apus. I got an anxiety attack right then and there, so... I don't know if I can answer your stupid question. Okay. Well, well, by the way, let me actually say one thing. Uh, I looked up the reference about Abu Bakr and the burning of uh, Murtad-Din. So this... I think that's in Tabari. I mean, uh, in Tabari. I've seen it in Tabari. Okay. So there there might be a reference there. I don't know if it's authentic, but the reference that that I'm looking up here says that this is a response because this was in the Ridda Wars. And these were apostates, and they had That's actually correct. attacked Muslims and had burned some Muslims alive. So this was like a fitting punishment. But usually, there's no burning people alive as a as a Sharia punishment. Now, I know that you and apostate prophet have a history, so but I, that I don't know much about it. But I know you do. But I do have to say, I, just to ask you the question though, in terms of taking a crack at it. Uh, Oh, you're, you're, you're uh, actually David making Wood? him. You're making him answer the David Wood or Osama bin Laden That's, question. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm pressing you a little bit. Osama bin Laden is dead, so I don't even understand the premise of the question. Yeah, pick someone who's alive, AP. <laughs> this one coming in from Stop Scamming Man says, "Hello, <clears throat> hello, Daniel. Given that the hypocrites that pretend to be Muslim burn in the worst of hell." Isn't the apostasy law going to coerce people into this? It's not going to coerce people into hypocrisy. Like people have the choice to believe in God or not and reject it. Um, So, yeah, there are hypocrites in a healthy society because a healthy society that's based on God's vision means that there will be people who will secretly hate God and will be evil people, but they have to manifest goodness in society as a whole. And that's a good thing. We want people to be good on the outside because the outside affects the inside. And the hope is that if people are acting good and they are abiding by Islamic practices and values, they're going to the mosques, they're worshiping, even if they don't believe uh, at first, that faith will grow in their hearts. Faith will grow and they will become strong, true believers. And that's the hope when you inculcate a society that abides by Islamic values. Whereas if you have a society that does not establish God's vision on earth and people are allowed to blaspheme and, uh, you know, commit all kinds of uh, godless acts, that's going to take the down the value of society, the character of society, that's going to spoil society and create a hell on earth. So, of course, Islam says it's better to have a society of goodness outwardly. And yes, there will be some hypocrites, but the sin is on them. That's better than a society where there is no hypocrisy because all the evil people can manifest their vile and their, their, their venom, their vile venom out in public. You got it. Thank you very much. And this one coming in from Shalma Ahad says, David, do you can this is kind of a two parter. So they said, David, do you consider prophet David a prophet because he didn't perform any miracles? And then they have one for, let's see, they said Muhammad Puba. I don't know if that was a typo. Is that? No, peace. that stands for peace be upon him. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> said, did many historically you, recorded, David. why don't you research it first? Wait, what? Well, what, what, did, what was the second part? I didn't hear it. 
You got it. They said, Muhammad, peace be upon him, did many historically recorded. Why don't you research first? Um, yeah, so Dave, my, my claim is not that a prophet has to perform miracles. Um, my claim is that if someone's coming along bringing a law and it, it's about slaughtering people and what people you're going to kill and so on and about fighting wars, uh, that should generally have some, it'd be a pretty good idea to have some good evidence because otherwise you get people who are just saying, Hey, God sent me. And now I have, now you all have to go out and slaughter in my name. And that's, a, I mean, that's what you have in the Bible when, when there's, when there's a law coming out and uh, there are things like death penalties and so on. Uh, God makes it very clear where that's coming from. As for the miracles of Muhammad, again, as I, stated i know and i i said this earlier i know that there are later sources that talk about muhammad's miracles so you have this in the sira you have this in the hadith those contradict the quran because over and over and over and over again in the quran the unbelievers are challenging muhammad why he wasn't performing why he wasn't sent with signs like earlier prophets and I believe Daniel responded that the Quran is just recording the accusations of these people who are criticizing Muhammad. But you also have Allah's responses to them. And if Muhammad was known for performing all these miracles, then when it says, you know, the unbelievers say, hey, why was not a sign sent with him? The response should have been, wait, what are you talking about? He split the moon. What are you talking about? He shoots water out of his fingers. What are you talking about? He does all these things. Instead, over and over and over again, the Quran gives excuses for why Muhammad uh, wasn't sent with any miracles. And so it, it's, it's basically, I mean, just think about it. I, I understand if you're a Muslim and you believe that Muhammad performed miracles, why you're, we're not on the same page here. But just think about it from my perspective. I've got the Quran. It repeatedly tries to explain why Muhammad's not performing miracles. And we see over and over again, the unbelievers are constantly pestering the Muslims, why isn't your guy sent with miracles? Why isn't your guy sent with miracles? Why isn't he sent with miracles? And we know that this would continue afterwards. So even later, when Muslims are going out, when you have this expansion and people are saying, hey, why, you know, uh, we, we, Muhammad is a prophet in line with the other prophets. Jews and Christians would have been continuing to ask, where's the, where's his miracles? Where are his miracles? Where are his miracles? And suddenly, over a century later, you get miracles in Ibn Asak. And two centuries later, in Sahih al-Bukhari, you get miracles and so on. Look at it from our perspective. Your earliest source explains why he didn't perform miracles. Sources that come much later say he performed all these miracles. What these later sources say doesn't line up at all with, with what the Quran say. The, the response in the Quran should have been, what are you talking about? He performs miracles all the time. And it's not. And so do we have good evidence that Muhammad performed miracles? Uh, I'd, I'd say no. Just can I just say something and then David can respond, have the final word on it? If it's super short and pithy, yeah, super, so super short. Like according, yeah. The thing, David, though, think about it. If if this is such like a defeater of Islam, and this is like so embarrassing that the, all these disbelievers are saying, "Hey, Muhammad, you don't have miracles." Why, it, according to you, Muhammad wrote the Quran. So why would he repeatedly mention this in these verses as you cited? Why would he keep br drawing attention to that fact if this is Muhammad who's writing? Uh, the Quran, according to you, it seems like he would not want to mention that at all. Why even raise the issue? Uh, Muhammad over Muhammad throughout the Quran is responding to accusations. Uh, and by the way, I don't have a position on whether Muhammad is deliberately uh, fabricating the Quran and claiming that it's from God, or if he actually was a person who sincerely believed he was a prophet and is just, you know, getting his revelations from somewhere else or from, from his own head or something like that. I don't really have a position. I can see arguments for various positions. Um, but as far as Muhammad uh, bringing this up, I mean, the unbelievers are constantly coming up with these uh, criticisms against Muhammad. And it's not just that uh, he can't perform miracles. It's that he's a madman. It's... Uh, so he's a madman. Uh, there are multiple accusations that he's a plagiarist. And Muhammad, it, 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 if we go with what you're saying, and he's actually coming up with responses to their objections, that's what he's doing, right? I mean, his followers are then uh, hearing these verses that he's revealing. And what are, what are 
what are the revelations that he's revealing? Their responses to these critics who who come up to him, so that the Muslims now memorize these responses. And so the next time someone comes up and says, "Hey, Muhammad, why didn't you get any revelation? I mean, why didn't you get any? Uh, wh why didn't you perform miracles like other prophets?" And then the Muslim can respond, "Ah, it's because previous generations, you know, they 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 didn't pay too much attention to miracles, and and so Muhammad has the Quran, and, and that's that's his miracle." Uh, so that would be my take on that. You got to thank you very much. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Greg Kanowitz says, why is Daniel conflating a religious society with a society that simply has laws? You don't need religion to have laws, Daniel. Why can't you see this? Well, if you want to have a society that has laws that are just, if you want to have a society, because who defines justice? I'm Muslim. I believe and I maintain that justice is based on what God says is good and evil, what God says is just and unjust. I assume that Christians share this understanding of justice and goodness. So if you want to have laws that are good and just, then they have to be tied to your religious beliefs because your religion expresses your deepest or, or the deepest truths about right and wrong, good and evil. So, of course, as a, as a Muslim and as you know, you're a Christian or a Jew, if you want a society run by just laws, of course it has to be religious. I mean, this is the sad thing that Christians in the modern period have separated uh, law from religion. And this is exactly what secularism is. And therefore, they've allowed this kind of atheistic understanding of the world, atheistic understanding of right and wrong to be imposed through a secular system to be imposed on all people in a way that actually destroys faith, in a way that actually destroys family, destroys marriage. This is, has, has happened because of this separating the laws from religion. I personally, okay, if here's, here's a choice that's given. If I were given a choice to live in an atheistic society with atheistic laws, versus a Christian society and Christian laws, I always choose the Christian society every single time. Why? Because those laws at least are Abrahamic. They're based on revelation. Christians are people of the book. They love God. They care about family. These are important values that I as a Muslim share. And I was born and raised in Texas. Texas is a very uh, conservative Christian uh, state. And I have, you know, loved and enjoyed my interaction with my Christian neighbors and Christian community. And unfortunately, I'm seeing Christians, especially this new generation, that's abandoning Christianity, that's abandoning traditional values. And it's because of this adoption of secular liberalism and this idea that no laws shouldn't be based on religion. So this is something that's traumatic for me personally. I would wish that Christians would wake up from this and realize this and see that Muslims are not the enemy. Islam is not the enemy. Turn off the TV, turn off all of this garbage against Muslims and see for yourself what's really happening. The actual antichrist system, the satanic system that's being used to wipe out humanity, wipe out belief in God. This is a huge problem and we have to address it. You got it. Thank you very much. And appreciate this question from Euthyphro Dilemma. You guys might have to help me decode this. They said, question for David. Ask an atheist. Daniel is presenting divine command theory. If Allah was a real prophet, are all commandments under Allah permissible? Also, both of you name one act that is immoral if God ordered it. Um, I didn't catch the first part. Could you read through that again slowly? You bet. <laughs> He's basically trying to give us the Euthyphro dilemma. Okay. Is he trying? Well, I understand I the Euthyphro say, dilemma. It's not, it's not relevant to the topic at hand. We don't need to get into a philosophy discussion about Plato and Greek philosophy. Well, could, I, you, read, could you read it again, though? Just because I didn't, uh, I didn't catch bet. the first part. And I might, I might agree with Daniel and say it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But yeah, I, I don't, I didn't actually detect the Euthyphro in it, but maybe it is. Let, they said, question for David, ask an atheist, Daniel is, you guys, folks, you got to use periods or commas here sometimes. Like, so they said, if Allah was a real prophet from... If is, Allah was a real prophet? Yeah, they said, is are all commandments under Allah permissible? I, I think... 
Yeah, I just don't. I understand think we're it. both confused. He, 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 it, it does look like he's going so, trying to go somewhere with the Euthyphro dilemma, but uh, we we need a clearer statement of what he's saying. You got it. And Notion Slave says, "Why is Wood stuck on tiny details of the way of life and ignoring the other ninety nine percent of the teachings? Just the same way that your parents share their way of life with you, so does Muhammad out of love and care. Is love strange to you?" Um, if he's talking about how I pointed out that Muhammad had all these little uh, tiny details for how to live and so on, uh, I'm not saying, hey, Muhammad had all these uh, rules that seem really strange to me about, you know, wiping with an uneven number of stones and so on, or, you know, plucking every so often and, and so on. It's it's not that. It's, I'm looking at kind of the, the entire picture, right? What reason do I have to believe this guy? What reason do I have to take this guy seriously as someone who's speaking uh, on behalf of God? Because as far as I can tell, he's contradicting the Old Testament and he's contradicting the New Testament. He's claiming to be in the same line with these these earlier prophets, and yet he seems to be contradicting them. Um, that's It could be that I'm misinterpreting something. And I, I'm misinterpreting and, and thinking that he's he's contradicting them when he really isn't. But what is the evidence that he's actually speaking from God? And and every I mean every argument I get, it turns out to be completely bogus, right? I mean, the perfect preservation of the Quran. No, it's not. Uh, the miracles in the Quran. I mean, the Quran says that the sun sets in a muddy pool. Uh, so so the arguments that I'm given turn out to be complete nonsense. Then there are problems like Muhammad affirms the inspiration preservation authority of the earlier scriptures and yet contradicts them so i'm looking at this and saying problems and then i'm looking at his life with him thinking that he's uh him thinking that he's demon possessed and needing to be talked out of that him being uh suicidal him thinking that uh that he's a victim of black magic and then all the moral issues and so on and then it's it's kind of uh, assessing his his personality and when I see him making all these little these little rules, that, that sounds like obsessive compulsive disorder. So I'm trying to put together a, a, like a like a psychological uh, profile here. And again, the point is not oh he's got all these little rules. That's a that's this huge problem. It's that it, it's something that kind of helps us understand who we're dealing with. And it can just I, I, I see nothing here. Can it's I really say something short, and you short respond, and David? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, very short. So if uh, Muhammad Sallallahu was obsessive compulsive, he has these psychological problems as, as you're characterizing him, how was he so successful? How was he so successful in bringing all of Arabia into Islam, then successfully defeating the biggest superpower of the time, which was the Persian Empire, and almost defeating the Roman Empire and at least bringing it to its knees and and really spreading the rule of Islam uh, as far west as uh, Morocco and as far east as uh, India, the subcontinent. Like this is proof of, of the divine favor on Muhammad that he was so successful and to characterize him as having psychological problems, like none of this would have been possible. He couldn't have inspired all of these people. And this is, this is historical, right? He's the most influential person. There's, you know, a debate about Jesus versus Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon them both. Uh, but you can't just characterize him with these cheap missionary arguments, David. Um, to be clear, you can be obsessive compulsive and be massively successful. Um, so just to be clear on that, as far as how Muhammad was successful, it, it's actually, I think, pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, when Muhammad came out with his early uh, arguments, it was things like, um, you know, my my revelations are so amazing in, in whatever way you, you know, different Muslims describe it in different ways, but uh, no one can imitate my revelations, so they must be from God. Uh, and he is actually found in the earlier scriptures, things like that. And he didn't win a ton of converts like that. It was a, it was a slow, it was a slow process. Um, later, the message kind of changed to, hey, let's go out and fight people and take all their stuff and subjugate the world. Join me. And if you, uh, if you, if we win and you survive, then we divide up the spoils of war. And if you die, you go to paradise where you'll, you know, get your, your hoodies and so on, your virgins. And that was massively successful. 
And uh, if it's just going to be, hey, how could it spread so fast unless it's true? I mean, gosh, communism spread rapidly. Coronavirus spread rapidly. There are all kinds of rapidly spreading things. But uh, I think we have a pretty good idea of, of how Islam spread rapidly. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Nada Verse says, question for Daniel. Biblical violence tends to be descriptive, while Quranic violence tends toward the prescriptive. Do you not see the difference? No, I, I fundamentally disagree. And all of these Christian scholars that I cited, all the Christian emperors, all of the uh, Jewish scholars, um, Maimonides, which I've been pronouncing as Maimonides uh, this whole time, they all agree that this is prescriptive, that the Old Testament is giving prescriptive instruction for uh, and commands from God in order to conquer the entire globe in expansionist war, in order to spread the word of God and to, uh, and to spread the justice of God. Um, that is something that's consistent in the Abrahamic faiths. It is prescriptive. And if you're a Christian, then you should expect this from Jesus Christ himself as well, because if he didn't practice this kind of expansionism in his own lifetime, that's fine. That's because that was not his aim. Uh, that was not his mission given to him by God uh, when he was on earth. But when he returns from heaven to earth, to defeat the Antichrist, he will be an expansionist. He will be a violent expansionist. And this is very clear in the Islamic tradition, and it's very clear in, uh, as I mentioned, the apocalyptic uh, traditions within the New Testament. So there's, I don't see how you can be a Christian and have a problem with this, and, and logically makes sense. The United States and the UN is the United Nations. They're expansionist. How? Because they say the entire world has to abide by this human rights directive that we are imposing. And if you do not abide by human rights, we will attack you and we will subjugate you. We will sanction you and we will bring you to heel if you do not abide by our dictates, our vision of right and wrong and what is good and bad. Except the UN and the United States have this secular, godless, atheistic uh, moral system that they're imposing violently, brutally across the entire globe in this kind of expansionist way. Uh, whereas the Abrahamic faiths, including Judaism and Christianity and Islam, we are trying to spread the word of God. We're trying to spread the justice that can only come from the creator. So logically think, Christians, please stop rehashing these old, tired, liberal arguments. Don't be liberal, secular people. When I say liberal, I don't mean like don't be a Democrat uh, because Republicans, Democrats, conservative, they all like the same liberal political garbage. I'm talking about a higher level philosophical liberalism with these ideals of separation of church and state and, and individual rights. This is what you need to reject. So stop co-opting these stupid arguments just to score cheap points against Islam. Look to your own tradition. Look to your own pre-modern scholars and what they say about the word of God and the justice of God. And then you'll realize that Muslims have the same message about justice. They have the same love for God. They have the same love for establishing truth and justice on the earth. And then you'll see that Muslims are not the enemy. And some of you, many of you, I pray, and I hope that many of you will become Muslim and see that the prophet Muhammad is the final prophet and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the Messiah and he will return with wrath and fury to kill the Antichrist. Notion Slave, thanks for your question as well, says Elisha in the Bible prayed to God to curse a group of 42 men calling for him, for calling him Baldy and two bears were sent by God to tear them apart. So, no. I think this is for you, David. I think that they're only saying that violence is, uh, you could say, endorsed or condoned. Or I've never denied that there's uh, violence. In the, I mean, I, I think I literally started my, I mean, in my opening statement, I mentioned Old Testament uh, violence. Uh, but we're, the debate is about Christian perspective on violence, and what I said was that Christians, um, we have to go with the, the commands that are actually directed towards us. There is, is a series of covenants in the Bible. Um, there's a series of covenants in the Bible, and the covenant that we're actually under, and you see the, early, you see the earlier covenants, it talks about who those covenants are directed towards, who are the people. And by the way, I, I don't know how 
someone doesn't know the language we're using here, a covenant is an agreement between God and a person or God and a particular group. So, uh, and a covenant is God says, I'm going to do this, and here's what you need to do in response. And what you have uh, in the Bible, you have these different covenants, and you have the covenant with the children of Israel, you know, the covenant with the children of Israel, um, and that's a, a good part of what we know as the Old Testament, but the Old Testament also talks about a new covenant coming that's not just for the children of Israel that's not tied to a particular piece of land, um, a covenant that's meant to be uh, a, a light around the world, a light to the Gentiles, it's meant to go around the world, the news of the Messiah. This is the covenant through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ gives commands to the people who are part of this covenant, and so it's a pretty straightforward um, situation if I'm under a covenant with God, and God tells me the obligations of the covenant that I'm under, it makes no sense to say, hey, I'm going to go follow the commands of a different covenant if they seem to be in conflict with the commands of the, the current covenant. And the main difference there is um, the, the old covenant is tied to a particular piece of land. The Jews are surrounded on all sides by people who want to rip them apart and destroy them and destroy their religion, destroy their, their people group. And so it's uh, they, they, will, they can only be sustained in that environment if they have God's uh, constant protection and God says, hey, you want protection? Here is the agreement. Uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, you can you can leave. But uh, if you want this ongoing protection, then here's what you have. He gives laws that they have to follow. They understand who they're rebelling against if they rebel. But that is a very different covenant than the covenant we have uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, that is not it's not tied to a land. We're not in the same situation where um, there are all these people just constantly trying to physically destroy our, our entire country and so on. And the covenant that we're under, the covenant that is meant to be spread around the world, um, Jesus died on the cross for sins. And it's a, a simple message that uh, if you want to be right with God, if you want to know God, if you want to spend eternity with God, guess what? You're not good enough. You are not good enough to live in the presence of God. And you can't you can't come up with a you you can't live a righteous enough life to really please God. The only way you can actually live in the presence of God is if you get a righteousness that comes from Him. And the gospel is a message about how God gives us the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of Jesus. And so if you accept it, then you're under that covenant. And that covenant tells you to love everyone. You got it. Thank you very much. And this question coming in for Daniel, XXWLZXX. Thanks so much, says Daniel is literally advocating for persecuting anyone who doesn't agree with his religion. What are your thoughts, Daniel? Uh, no, as I've said uh, before, there's not this command for just um, indiscriminate killing um, an expansionist war in Islam. Expansion can be used. It's in the discretion of the emir, the leader of Muslims. So if there is a need to expand or there's opportunity to, to expand the rule of Islam, then that can happen. And it doesn't involve just massacring people as described in, in the Old Testament and affirmed by Orthodox Jewish law and, and Christian authorities. It, it, it involves establishing the Sharia, and people become ahl dhimma basically, the protected people who have to pay, you know, the jizya have to pay a certain tax, but they're protected and they're under the control of, of the Sharia. And I already addressed that there's not exactly equal rights um, because there's an incentive for people to become Muslim. Uh, they're not eradicated, but this Islamic society provides incentives so that people can accept Islam and be Muslims, but if people choose not to do that, they can continue to practice um, Christianity, practice Judaism, according to some interpretations, even Hinduism, uh, that can be practiced under the Islamic rule. And I think that's a better system of tolerance. This is the traditional tolerance that I was explaining before. It's much better than the quote unquote liberal tolerance that atomizes society and creates all of this um, 
individualism gone awry. You know, we give in Islam individual rights, but there's a limit. If you maximize individual rights without limit, that causes the destruction of family, that causes the destruction of community and marriage and, and everything, all the problems that we see with the modern world. But Islam's understanding of tolerance is that, yes, the Ahlul Dhimma, the people of the book, they practice their religious rituals. They maintain their family law, their inheritance law. They maintain their rules of commercial transaction amongst themselves. And Islam protects them. And yes, I conceded that it's not a perfectly equal system between Muslims and non-Muslims because there's the incentive to convert. But that, I would argue, that Christians living under that rule of law, Jews living under that rule of law, despite it not being liberally tolerant, would prefer that much more than the destruction of their customs, their traditions, and their entire religions under the secular modern regime. And again, the proof is in the pudding because we see Christians who have maintained their religion for 1,400 years under Sharia law, this supposedly terrible, barbaric, uh, intolerant law. They've preserved it for 1,400 years, whereas Christians are dying off, basically, becoming apostates. Their church is shuddering throughout the Western secular world that is supposedly so much more tolerant. Islam is the only religion, unfortunately, that's standing up against this secular liberal behemoth, this monster. I wish that Christians would wake up and also stand against this. But right now, Islam is the only religion that's standing up for these Abrahamic values. I feel like I've defended the Old Testament more in this debate, the Bible more in this debate than David has. I mean, what does that tell you? This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Zagros Ozkan says, Daniel and David, first David, would you guys sacrifice your firstborns if your God commanded it to you like he did with Abraham? I can say, yes, God commands me and I'm a prophet of God like Abraham. Yes, of course. I obey God. Um, we hear and we obey. And uh, I'm a diagnosed psychopath, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I have, I have to say, there's, um, yeah, that is something I could, I, I would have a problem in that I would, I would not believe that it's from God, given the revelations that have been handed to me. But if, if I knew that it were from God, fortunately, I'm never in this situation. I've been commanded to love everyone, to harm no one, and so on. Um, but yeah, I have to say that uh, I have this sort of personality that i would obey god again come on, come on david if it were come me. on what? just defend abraham just tell them when they I just ask said when these liberals just I say just straight, said yes god commands it i will do that don't just like give this long explanation no, I, say yes be a chad david no, I, be a look, chad look, look, yo, yo, yo. i know from experience as soon as you say i would uh yes I, I i would kill my son if i were ordered to or something like that they all run with that and say he's he's gonna kill his son as soon as he hears a voice or something like that and he's already crazy so he's gonna hear a voice and so i'm let pointing out I'm, people, I'm pointing out that let these losers say whatever they want uh defend it, it, abraham this is it's not abraham be proud, it's norm, david it's normally it's normally muslim saying it <laughs> No, to... but how could Muslims say it? Because Muslims believe in this, uh, that Abraham was commanded, and he was going to do it. He was going to sacrifice his son. That's, uh, that's what we believe. So how can they accuse you? Well, they Forget do. about these looter, losers, David. They do. I think you need to give a strong answer. Be a Chad. You can do it. I believe in you. Yeah, and by the way, in the, in the, just so everyone knows, in the Bible, uh, God had made promises to Abraham about his son and about the covenant coming through his son. So the Bible also says that as far as Abraham's reasoning, it was God made these promises about this son, and he's commanding me to kill him. Therefore, even if I kill him, God is going to raise him from the dead. That, th those are Abraham's thought processes. And then when he's ready to do it, uh, what's really cool is he's he's willing to do it. And if you look, this is not a message about, hey, everyone should uh, should always be ready to kill their kids. In the surrounding culture, the highest form of worship, according to some of these weird groups, was ch child sacrifice, right? And so the, the takeaway message from that situation is... God is saying, hey, you know, Abraham, you all have this test about the, the greatest thing someone can do is to sacrifice their child. Uh, Abraham is just as devout and obedient as any of the rest of you. The difference between 
you and Abraham is you have a different God. Your God requires that child sacrifice. Abraham's God doesn't require that sacrifice. Abraham's God provides his own sacrifice. And notice what uh, Abraham Abraham even said, God will provide the sacrifice. God will provide the lamb. And if you look, you know, when Abraham said, oh, let me just finish. I'm almost done. Abraham said, uh, Abraham said when he was asked by Isaac, hey, you know, where's the sacrifice? Abraham said, God will provide the lamb for sacrifice. And if you look, then God provided a ram. What happened to the lamb? Well, very interesting. That whole situation was on Mount Moriah. That's where Jerusalem is. And that's where the lamb of God became the sacrifice of, uh, of God. So interesting how all this scripture ties you're, together. You're just... You're just liberal explaining. Look, you're getting the you gospel. From, out, you're getting the bring a sword. This is how you answer. You just flash this sword and say, "Yes, I would." <laughs> bring a sword to all of these debates and conversations, David, and prove that you're a Chad. You're not embarrassed about your scripture. Yes, I would. Yes, I'm just trying. To, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to give a complete picture there because everyone's going to again. They're going no, to they're, ah, they're, they're, ta- they're talking it. about killing kids. What's up with these guys? They're talking about let killing them, kids. Let yes. them shout. Make, 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 them look, that. make them look like fools. Make them we're look like jump. fools. That's we're going to jump. We're going to jump into the next one. Do want to say thanks. We got to wrap up in just a few minutes, folks, as our guests have been. We've already gone over time for the Q&A, but want to say thank you so much. We have, we're have. we going to maybe go with one or two more questions. And thank you. Huge thank you to our guests who have been so... I even I look at you guys and you look <laughs> like you could go for another two hours. You look high energy. And I'm like, wow. Anyway. The, o- the only thing, the only problem is... Uh... I've had uh, two and a half liters of water here. So that is the only thing holding me back right now. Why has this debate revolved around urine so much? <laughs> More on that later. But Muzzy, Be- Muzzy Buzz says, can David give us an example of a peaceful Christian empire in history? Why has every example for Christendom been one of extreme violence and subjugation? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what 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 you mean here i mean if you if you look there there are plenty of of christian nations down through history that yes they they fight um but i mean how, gosh how many christian nations are there in the world how many of them are going out trying to subjugate the world there, there aren't a lot they'll, they'll fight if they if they need to but um it's just a it's kind of a modern it's kind of a modern uh problem and that you and you see it you see it largely from atheists like sam harris talked about something like the vast majority of history's wars were fought in the name of religion and it actually wasn't it's something like six percent of history's wars were fought uh in the name of religion but we tend to look back at every christian country and you know muslim countries and so on and think that these these wars they're they're fighting are all over religion they did sometimes have some wars over religion especially you know especially in islam uh but you know the the, the wars would generally be over it would be over territory or it would be over who's the appropriate king and so on and so yeah the, the vast majority of, of history's wars had nothing to do with uh uh, with religion. So don't think, oh, here's a Christian country and it's at a war with another Christian country. They're fighting over Jesus. Eh, usually they're not. You got it. And want to let you know, folks, we've got to let these guys get to sleep. We've got to let David go to the bathroom. But I want to let you know they're linked in the description. We really do appreciate David and Daniel. It has been a true pleasure to host you guys. This has honestly been, I, this will be like one of the best we've had, I think, on Modern Day Debate all the while that it's existed. So I want to say thank you so much. This has been tremendous. Yeah, I'd like to thank you, James, for uh, organizing and moderating. I appreciate all your help. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to do these. I, and I also um, thank David for taking the time. And I appreciated uh, talking to you and hearing your perspective. And, and what I said about uh, you and your family, I, I really did mean that. So um, thank you. Yep. And uh, thanks to you both. And thanks, everyone, for watching.